Health meeting for um, February 10th, 2021 at 6 p.m. Um, and then I'll have Trevor read all that stuff. Thank okay. you, Trevor. Oh, you're welcome. Sure. Um, so meetings normally held uh, here at the municipal offices at 8 Conway Street, South Deerfield, Mass. are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with the governor's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20. Meetings are typically broadcast on Frontier Community Access Television. Uh, remote meeting connections are, are noted below. And when I say that, you can go to our town website on the front page on the bottom right, you'll see this meeting listed. You can click on that, you'll see an agenda. If you click on that agenda, you'll also see a link um, for people listening on FCAP but want to call in and have a comment, they would dial 312-626-7, uh, excuse me, 312-626-6799. Um, the meeting ID is 911-604-1580. And should you need the passcode, it's 570012. Um, there's also, again, there's a link to this meeting here um, if you, if you want to be on a device. Meeting attendees should mute their phone, which is star six for landlines, unless speaking um, or less asking a question or commenting. And um, all attendees should wait to speak until other participants are finished. So thank you and welcome to the meeting. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, so let's get started. Dave um, and Justin are here from uh, Cricket um, Consulting on our, on our sewer treatment plant. Yeah. How are you guys? Thanks, Carolyn. So we know we've got a tight window. You've got another packed agenda as usual. So this evening, Justin's here with me. Uh, he's going to give you an overview of the equipment pre-procurement, which is going to sound and feel very similar to what we did for the last Clarifier project, which went very well. Yep. And uh, at the conclusion of that, Justin, I'll just give you a quick update on the, the bidding schedule for the phase one upgrade. Great. Yeah, so with that introduction, um, can you actually see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. So as some of you may know, for the first uh, project that was completed last year for the secondary clarifier at the treatment plant, we went through the same uh, 30B process. So there's guidance, you know, through the state, um, which we followed uh, to go ahead and put RFPs out uh, to solicit, you know, bids for critical pieces of equipment to the upgrade. Um, essentially, those four pieces of equipment um, number one was grit removal, which was to be included in our proposed headworks building. This is just an overview of the, the overall project. Um, the headworks screen, which removes all the rags and you know floatables from the waste stream, that's also to be included in the proposed headworks building. And then we had another secondary clarifier that's going to be built as part of this project, essentially mirroring you know where the existing clarifier is now. Um, so that was another piece of equipment, the internals of that tank. And then we also had a UV disinfection system, uh, which is to replace um, their current means of disinfection in the new process operations building. Um, so we thought that these pieces of equipment were critical enough to go through this process. Um, essentially, for those who aren't familiar with it, it allows us to look at the uh, equipment from you know, evaluative criteria standpoint, but then also factoring in uh, cost considerations. Um, so we can make sure that the town's getting, you know, a good piece of equipment um, at a good price, I guess, overall. Yep. Um, Great. So we, so we issued RFPs for the four different pieces of equipment. We went through that process. And um, what I'm gonna go to here was just a summary memorandum that we pro provided to the board. Um, I guess I could just walk through at a high level and if we wanted yeah. to about Please. any of these, we can. Okay. Um, so essentially for the secondary clarifier, we received three separate proposals uh, from manufacturers. Essentially what ended up happening from the scoring and also looking at the price was that it lined up nicely that the highest rated proposal from the scoring method contained in the RFP was also the lowest cost. So that one you know, seemed to line up um, being pretty straightforward in terms of what we would recommend for an award. And it also happens to be the same manufacturer of the existing clarifier that was just upgraded last year. So there's added benefits to that uh, to keep down at the plant in terms of spare parts that he's keeping on the shelf and, and things of that nature. Um, so we thought that one worked out, you know, pretty nicely overall. Yeah. Anecdotally, the, uh, the result for that, the pricing was actually lower this time than it was last time for the first clarifier procurement. 
Oh, great. We're, we're hoping that that's encouraging news for the upgrade. There's been yeah. a lot of volatility in the construction market yeah. over the last year. We'll see. But, um, you know, yeah. when good news presents itself, we want to share it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, kind of the same case with the UV disinfection system. And you'll see for a, a couple of these, it worked out nicely. Um, we received two proposals on that from manufacturers that we expected that would submit. Um, and again, the highest scoring proposal was also the lowest price. So we believe, you know, and I should say that we look at the evaluation without the price being considered at all before we even go to open those envelopes. Yep. It just shows that we think it was the best piece of equipment, but it was also the most cost effective for the town. So it just kind of, you know, shows how the process goes there. And then the last two, the mechanical screening system. Um, we received three proposals. Um, the highest rated proposal in this case actually had an error on their bid form and did not submit a price, so we could not move forward with them. Um, we do know just from experience that they probably would have been the higher, you know, price out of these, but we honestly can't, can't really tell, you know, at this point. But the next highest rated proposal was also the lowest price. So again, we think the town ended up with the best, you know, solution in this case. Um, and the last one here was the grit removal system, which we only received one proposal for. Um, you know, this would be the one case where we would recommend to the board that we reject that one proposal that was received and include this grit removal system as part of, you know, the general contractor's uh, scope when he submits his bid. Um, we think, you know, this will have the contractor shopping around to obtain, you know, better pricing for the town. Um, than may have been received from this single vendor. Um, do you, Are question. they likely to include that? Well, they, so, so one yeah. of the things we're we're likely going to do, subject to the decision that the select board makes this evening, is go back for that particular specification and loosen its restrictiveness a little bit, such that mm -hmm. there can be a little bit better competition, and and two, three, four bidders can all pursue um, the grid system and that will provide the town with the most advantageous pricing um, yet still have a high quality piece of equipment. So we just weren't comfortable with the perspective of just the one price. Um, right. And as promised with the public and during this process, as it's gone on, we wanted to make sure that not only we were getting good equipment, but we were getting the most cost competitive pricing yeah. from the equipment. And, and with uh, with doing that, we'll be able to write the spec and that will still demand, obviously, a high quality price, a high quality equipment, you know, regardless of the price, right? So, I mean, it's yeah, not that's correct. I mean, it's you know, all of this wastewater type equipment it is somewhat proprietary in its own nature. But as an example, the two variables with the grid system are how big of a diameter is the tank that the you know the sand and everything is circulated out. Um, and then what type of pump is used to pump the grit slurry out of the tank. So some manufacturers use a submersible pump, some of them use a suction lift pump. Um, based on how the initial package was written, a couple of the potentially competing manufacturers that do make good systems uh, didn't feel that they'd have an, you know, an opportunity to be competitive uh, with the proposal and were worried about some of the technical elements of the conformance with the specs as opposed to just pricing. So now what we're going to do is take that information subject to your decision and, you know, refine the specifications to allow better, better bidding per se, yeah. or more competitive bidding. Okay. That makes sense. So on three of the fronts, I think the takeaway is that we're recommending to the town that you proceed with uh, very advantageous firms uh, for the manufacturers and also in all three of those cases, they're the lowest price that we received of the bids right. that were open. Yep. And yep. for the fourth category, we're just gonna put that back and circulate it uh, as a traditional element that the contractor will incorporate in their bid. Right. Mm -hmm. Hey Dave, Dave on that uh, grit removal, um, have you entertained using a diaphragm pump instead? So we haven't for that particular piece of equipment. There's about five vendors that make this um, this cyclone grit system, where you know essentially everything's coming in and rotating around, and the the heavy things settle out, and the, all the wastewater keeps going. 
those manufacturers all either provide a suction lift pump, a uh, self-priming uh, suction lift pump, or um, a vacuum prime suction lift, or a submersible pump. Um, we, we, we are fans of those positive displacement pumps that you mentioned, Dave. Um, in this case, it just kind of comes down to how the vendors package it. And what we, what we didn't want to do was pull an element from the system and then have a vendor say that their system isn't working because we forced um, an alternative pump on it and then they're doing this when there's a problem. So we, yeah. we, we give the vendor the full responsibility for performance to the specifications and, and those are the three types of pumps they provide. But what you mentioned is a great pump and you know, it's certainly uh, uh, well, it's something that we use in other places in the plant. My experience is the other types of pumps have a high maintenance with a heavy grip. They do. The um, it's it's a sacrificial part for sure. Um, it's it's not the most expensive part of the system with all the other you know stainless steel and everything. But um, yeah, grit pumps in general only last two or three years. Um, it's it's one of those recurring maintenance issues. But there's got to be some you know sacrificial part uh, like there is on an impeller on an influent pump. Just they you know yeah. can be relatively easy replaced. So there's pros and cons to different pumps. The submersibles yeah. are really efficient. The suction lift. Um, Keith and his guys can get to everything because they're all grade. So um, we just want to make sure that um, we give those options. Okay. To your point, just let you know, let them kind of pick the type of that they want with their system so that they can be cost competitive. Okay. It's good to know we've got a grid expert in the house. We'll know yes. who's going to be watching on that piece of the project. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's good to have the. I'm knowledge. always up to my neck in grit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Keith wouldn't mind another operator down there, right. especially if that right. works. <laughs> um, did, so uh, any other questions on that? Or would, you're, we're probably looking for a vote on that, I would imagine, so that we can move forward. We, we would need uh, an action on behalf of the select board and yeah. the public record so that we can proceed. And right. Justin's I, memo did a good job of articulating a mem uh, you know, some language for your consideration. Yeah. I mean, I, I think... Um, Unless there's any other discussion, I, I would I would uh, make a motion to move forward with the recommendations uh, from D, uh, DPC and the memorandum for the equipment that we uh, secured through uh, 30B procurement. Do we, do we have a second? Dave Wolf, I'm second. Okay, um, so we're just we're voting on the whole thing, all the recommendations. Yes, all yeah, okay. all three will go in, and then the last one, that four, will will get uh, thrown back okay. into the general bid. All right, I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, yep. um, all those uh, in favor, if there's no I, further discussion. I, Trevor McDaniel. I, Dave Wolfer. I, Carolyn Ness. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Um, we'll see you Friday. So, yeah. Yep, thanks a lot. Yeah, so um, let's see. So there's no uh, no other questions we need for, for them tonight, right? Sorry, or, I'll take no, that's okay. Yeah. We're pretty good. Um, yeah, Trevor, uh, if you wanted, I was just going to show just a quick update, kind of where the timeline goes from here. Yeah, that'd be great. I know we got just, a just real quick. I know you don't have time. Yeah. So well, that'd um, be yeah, we're going to make the bid documents available on Tuesday. So newspaper ads will run on Tuesday. It's already been published in the central register and we're getting that onto combines in the next day or two. Um, we're going to have a non-mandatory uh, pre-bid phone call on the 22nd of February. And then we're going to do three rounds of tours. So with COVID, we found that it's easier to just limit group sizes because these contracts yep. still need to get out to the site and get their eyes on it. Sure. We'll schedule some tours in small groups for March 3rd. And yep. then the general bid opening will be at the end of March, March 31st, as of now. Yep. With, uh, filed sub bids coming in two weeks before that. Um, so okay. those are the, the key milestones, the way things look now. So it looks like going into April, we'll be ready to hit the ground running, uh, which That's should great. And we, had a, schedules. we had a, a, a team meeting the other day, I think it was Tuesday on um, yesterday, maybe on, with USDA. And I know Barb and uh, Casey and Brenda have been working with USDA to get all the kind of information needed from bond councils so that all our ducks in a row and, and we get the blessing from USDA to move forward. I think we'll have what we were going to do is request that we move forward, even if there's a couple pieces of paper that we're still chasing. But I think we'll have most of it. Uh, done, I believe, by then. I think Barb knows what she needed from Jennifer. Um, so I think we're, we're in good shape. Great. Okay. Well, thanks so much. I look forward to, to seeing you guys uh, a little bit more on uh, Friday.
Thanks very yes, much. Thank you very much. Yeah, Have a good evening tonight. Thank, thank you, you. Good, for the bye help. Bye. Yeah. Great. Bye bye. Okay. Um, Mark, could you introduce yourself if you're on and um, tell us about your low income opportunities in the in municipal aggregation? I have to Absolutely. tell you, Mark, I think there's a lot of confusion. <laughs> It will, be, it will be simple. We'll, 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 we'll clarify that in two seconds. It's Mark Capitona, uh, Colonial Power Group. Um, I'm here to kind of introduce a, an add-on to the existing program that exists um, in Deerfield, their municipal ag aggregation program. And all, all we're proposing here is to simply deliver a discount uh, to the low-income customers that are participating in your program. So think of Deerfield as nothing more than the facilitator of a discount we're going to use the latest iteration of the D Department of Energy Resources SMART program. It was SREC 1, SREC 2, and this is SMART. All we're going to do is match up a solar developer with the uh, town of Deerfield's load, and what, what will happen is the town of Deerfield will say, yes, we'll take this power and we'll deliver this discount to our low-income customers. Our targeted discount is, is uh, two cents a kilowatt hour, so currently in Deerfield, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about, in the Deerfield aggregation, the current rate is uh, 9.5, uh, 3.4, but 9.5 to the, to the average person, they're paying 9.5 cents a kilowatt hour. The low income customer here would be paying uh, 7.5. And right. on top of that, they would then get their low income discount delivered by the utility, which is 32% on top of that discount. It doesn't cost the town anything, doesn't cost the customer anything. This works identically to the way aggregation works, doesn't require, uh, the, there's no contract for the um, low income customer, they can come and go as they wish. What it does require is the town to take this discount because it's a solar contract through the state program, it does require us to take the discount for 20 years. What will happen after this program? So right now you have a contract for three years. We'll work with this if you were to, to move forward, we'll work with the current supplier, Dynagy, to lower their rate. Make no mistake, Dynagy loves this. It allows them to show the, the uh, Attorney General and Department of Public Utilities, look at what good people we are, it costs them nothing. So they're very happy with the program as well from the supplier standpoint. Um, but the next contract, we'll make sure that everyone that bids knows that you have this discount and that they're to include that in their price and that they will be delivering this discount for you. Give you an idea. If the price went up on the next, you really got the market at a great time here. Say the market went up to 10.5, the, the low-income customer would be paying 8.5. If the rate went down to say 7.5, they would be paying 5.5. Five. Just to give you the, the, the target price is that uh, two cents below. Again, we're not in control of making the sunshine or the usage of the customer, so that may fluctuate from time to time. But ultimately, all you are this, uh, is a facilitator of this discount. I have one, um, there, there's one little hiccup right now, the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, the city of Boston has signed up for 130 megawatts of low-income community solar. They asked them not to market the program while they validate the, um, so the, this, is, this is where we're going to get into a bunch of acronyms, right? This is a Department of Energy Resource Program. They're saying because it's a municipal aggregation plan, they would like to take a look at this and make sure it meets all the regulations. We've been held up for the last two months while they're looking at this. All they're asking us is not to market. They, can't, they didn't say we couldn't do it. We have a letter of authorization from uh, the Department of Energy Resources that this meets all the regulations. So wh what we're asking is, is that the town would enter into a contract with a solar developer on the other side that matches up, and we would be delivering this benefit. Other than that, there really, there is no hooks on you. There's no add to staff, there's nothing. Colonial is going to take care of all the management of it and all, all the reporting that goes just like we will for the aggregation. We're just, yes. This is just something that, that, that came about through the SMART program. Literally, that's how simple this is. So I don't know if there's more confusion. I know you guys have a stacked agenda, so I wanted to get to your questions so I could answer those as soon as possible. But you have the basic concept right now. What are the, what are the uh, this is Trevor McDaniel, what are the um, 
what's the cutoff for low income? How do we, you know, how do they decide that? It- yep. Believe it or not, so the utility actually tells us so this is your advantage. So it's very difficult for other people to find out where all the low income customers are. But the utility puts uh, a designation on, a, on a, they call it a residential assisted customer in Eversource, yeah. and that's an R2 designation. So I know every low income customer in uh, Deerfield, and we can deliver that benefit to them. You don't have to vet yeah. them or anything. Right. They don't need to. Yeah, we don't have to talk about that. They just they would just get that opportunity. Yeah, we would send them a mailing 30 days before it starts just to let them know here's the situation. And, and then if they if they chose to do something, they could do something. But it would just be a notification letter and then they would start receiving the uh, discount. So they don't really have to do anything to receive the discount. It would be automatic. It, it would be it, it, just like the aggregation, sir. Right. Exact exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yep. OK. I, don't okay. I think it's worth repeating just so that we don't have any issues. Can you just repeat that they do not have to do anything? It will be yes. automatically applied. So if the, if the town signed the MOU and the ASA, it would automatically be applied to the low-income customer's bill, this two-cent discount. To get into the weeds, the way it would actually work is the solar developer will send in the funds of whatever kilowatts they use for that month, and then we'll send those over to the uh, to Dynagy so that that Dynagy is made whole and the customer gets that benefit. Okay. Pretty easy. Yep. Um, is there any? Was there any discussion? Ma, do you want to say anything before we vote on this? And you're muted. You're muted. Ma, just to, yep. There you go. Hey. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, one, Mark, I. I went on the Eversource um, website and they said the discount on the website was 36% and, and you say 32. Is that, um, I mean, that's a- I, I just, yep. I believe Eversource East is 36%. Eversource West is 32%. Okay. That's- and I, I may have that incorrect. If I am, I apologize for that, but I know Eversource East is 36 I thought it was a little bit less in the West. All right. It just, in, in for our newsletter, I had 36 in there, so I need to correct that. That's all. Yep. So, um, and then the other thing that in relation to us describing, well, first of all, it's okay for us to put an art, put this in the newsletter. Is that correct? I know. It is okay. Yes, uh, um, and I believe we made a couple of changes. Yes. So uh, as long as those are uh, that way, our, our attorney looked at those and those were the changes he requested. He believes okay. we're in violation of nothing. Okay, that's good. Um, the other thing is there's been some discussion as far as uh, w- when we had our conversation online uh, at the last Zoom, um, there was some discussion about people who um, qualify to be a low income customer and uh, but are not are not signed up for it right now and um, so we wanted to sort of put some information in the newsletter about that and there do do they have to go do they apply if if they want to be well first of all if they meet the income standards which are remarkably high um, then do they apply to Eversource or do they have to apply to a, a group like Community Action out here or somebody else to, uh, to qualify for fuel assistance and then they go to Eversource and fill out those forms or do they, can they just go straight to Eversource? They can go directly to Eversource, but if they participate in any of those programs, that gives them automatic eligibility Right. when they go to Eversource. Right. If they don't, I mean, you know, if they if they don't participate in those, they can go straight to Eversource and they don't have to go to through community action. That is a correct statement. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Those are my two questions. Great, we'll, clar- we'll clarify that in, in the newsletter. OK. All right. Um, Dave, do you have any more questions or do you want to uh, can we uh, vote on this? Mark, uh, Colonial Power, if I recall, they also do aggregation with uh, communities and industrial stuff for bidding on electricity? Yeah, so it's, we, we only do municipal aggregation, uh, Mr. Wolfram, and okay. any, any one that's on basic service, whether it's commercial, industrial, residential, 
everyone's included in that, that town program if they're on basic service. Okay. Okay. Where's your office? Is it in Springfield? But Marlboro, Massachusetts. Marlboro? Okay. Great. All right. Um, I'll take a motion to approve the MOU. Uh, uh, this is Trevor McDaniel. I'll make the motion to approve the MOU for the uh, Smart Aggregation Program and the discount for low income you as presented. Welcome. Second it. All right. Is there any further discussion? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Thank just, you, Mark, for coming. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And, thank uh, you, Mark. And uh, Ma, thank you for uh, and the and the committee for putting a newsletter together. I think that's a great idea to start explaining that to people. And um, it it can be confusing. Electricity just seems to be one of those things that is confusing. Yes. So yes, um, I, um, oh. I I just want to say thank you, Ma, because I, I've I've had so many phone calls, and I, I truthfully um, it's hard to explain, and I'm not really sure. Yep. So first of all. Um, I got a call from from the technician today so that the, the phone line is going to be fixed so I can start receiving those calls. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, I've been uh, they've been referring people over to me, but don't hesitate. You know, if you have questions, I, I'm fine with, you know, having people call me and and That's great. and answer That's questions. Um, the second. Well, I was just going to. Yeah, I want to I wanted to talk to you about the newsletter so but rocky okay. has a question. yeah rocky i just what want to get a question in from rocky yeah go ahead oh you're on you're on mute uh rocky oh, sorry <laughs> yep, you're good now you're all set yeah. uh the um ma is probably going to hit on it anyway how do you get the newsletter ma that's all i wanted to know great oh, thank you um, thank you for the question that that's uh the newsletter is going to be posted on the website it's also going to be posted on deerfield now okay. it, but we're also going to be doing a mailing to every residence in okay. in Deerfield, so everyone will receive this newsletter. Thank you. And it'll. How it'll, are you, Rocky? Good. <laughs> it'll look it'll look something like this, but of course, I know that she has to update things, so this is not exactly what it will look what it will be, but um, but it'll look similar to this. So if you see it, um, okay. There you go. Everybody will get it unless you live on South Main Street. <laughs> Well, I, I think what happened is everybody got a big jump in their electric bill and they were all concerned that it was a result of what we were trying to do and not that we were giving them a discount. We were actually giving them a surcharge or extra charges or something. So thank the only, you. The yeah. only jump that I know of is the one that the state put in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which, is, which was very small. It was like a mill, but... Um, well, it just seemed like everybody's rates, uh, the the electric bill seemed to have gone way up last month. So well, the know. last billing cycle, Probably. or maybe it was two billing cycles ago. I don't know, but there was. It would, like if, a, if, if it's the state one, it would have been two bi billing cycles yeah. ago. And and it, the state did it to everybody. So if you get Eversource or, or Dynagy or whoever you use, the state kicked it up, kicked up a, to put on a tax. And I don't know. It was it was it was going around on Facebook, and uh, Trevor yeah, no, probably we, remembers it. We've we've uh, we've given people a discount, not an increase. So it's yes, been, been good. That's, that's, true. that's why it's nice to have when, you come and say and that, MA. Using more electricity and costing more—that's a different story. But that's exactly right. There's probably yeah. a correlation between the bills so and just, the lights. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> the just a quick different. question on the newsletter. Um, once you all have approved it, it's been through next, next amp has approved it. And uh, with a couple of corrections and um, colonials approved it and they've made their corrections. Great. So what we'd like to do is get your approval uh, so that we can then go ahead with the mailing process. Okay. Yeah. I'd make a motion. Sounds wonderful. Well, board. As soon as you get it to us, I'm able to try to review it. I, I, I will right I, back to you. I I've gotten it to you, except for there's two little corrections that Colonial made that I just noticed were not in the most recent one that I sent out that we that David sent out today. Okay. Um, and they are basically just saying, using the future tense rather than the present tense. 
Okay. Do That's what the lawyer said. So it's, it did not, it doesn't affect the content at all. And um, no. there's a couple of little uh, um, edit, you know, little uh, capital letters and just little teeny things that I, yeah. having reread it again, there's a couple of little things. That well, do we want to just allow Casey to approve it when it comes in or do you, or do you, what do you want to do? Do you want to wait another two weeks or? I'd rather not. If I get a choice, what do you think? What do you think, Carolyn? Um, I, I, I think if Ma sends it to us individually and Casey, and then we um, just review it, just read it. I mean, okay. I, I can, I can foresee that I would probably have very little problem with it. Right. Um, with that many people reviewing it already. Yep. So, um, it's just nice to have the opportunity to do it to know what's going out in the mailing. Right. Yep. I, I, and, want, I wanted you to have that. So. Yeah. Right. So I um, should just send it to you individually? Yes, and then we will just email you back if we have any issues, but or any questions. Or Casey? Perfect. Casey? You can't do that, Carolyn. Yeah, it's outside it's, an open meeting. Yeah, it would just. Even if MA is the one distributing it and then going Doesn't back? Matter. Doesn't that matter. That was All clarified right. last night in the oh. call. Oh my gosh, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, we're not even discussing anything. We're not even contacting each other, but well, MA, I've... I you will need it. to send it to Casey. Casey will send it out to us, and then we will send it back to Casey. I don't think you can't so. do that either. No, because you can't discuss the item outside of a meeting. I've. Um, if you look in your email later, it. it's there. Like I've I didn't get it until the afternoon, Carolyn. So I wasn't able to amp to get put it into the packet. Um. Oh. um well, you know what, then, MA, never mind. We have to, I guess we're going to have to trust you because, um, I mean, I, we do trust you. Why don't you send it to me and I'll read through it, MA. I, 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 I read just, it. I, I would make a motion to allow Casey to approve the letter going out, um, unless there's any other, you know. So I'll just fine. make that motion. And if, if somebody wants to second that or not, that's fine. I, I will second that. Okay, thank you. I, I just, I'm, I'm, Sometimes I get a little frustrated because with open meeting law, well, yes, yeah, because all it's we're so doing is tough. looking at it as a editing it and giving right. it back to Casey if there's any issues. Right. I don't understand that. Yep, it's all um, especially if there's no decisions. There's right. not a decision on it other than it's not a question problem. of decisions according to Adam. It's a question of discussion. Yeah. Yeah, but if we're discussing it with you or MA individually, that doesn't seem like it's an issue. Well, I can send it out to you. It's just um, never mind. I mean, it's okay. It's not worth arguing about. But it the just motion in like a second. It's uh, not the correct interpretation. Um, okay. Well, thank you. We need a vote. Do thank I have you. Vote? We need a vote. Yes. The motion in a second. Uh, Dave, did you second it? Actually, you did. You did. Oh, you did, did I? Did. <laughs> <laughs> I was so ripped that I already <laughs> forgot. <laughs> It's not bad internet tonight, Trevor. It's just I me. Know. <laughs> anyway, all those in favor. Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Okay, no, this is just me tonight. No bad internet. Maybe I should go back to bad internet. <laughs> oh. Thank you, okay. Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Be safe. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, MA. Bye bye. Um, I. I see that Julie is on tonight, and um, I really want to get to prioritizing our um, list to talk to um, both Natalie and Joe. But I, I, I'm really excited about the two presentations that Julie is organizing. Oh, yes. So I was hoping she could just give us a little bit of a rundown on it and for anybody that's listening. Um, it's the 13th and the 27th. So Julie, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. So these are, hi, these are town building advisory committee meetings. Um, the first one on the 13th will be GRLA, the architects that were hired to do an assessment of four town buildings, um, the town hall, the highway garage, the building the senior center is in, and the um, empty church building that was donated to the town. So the architects have surveyed those buildings, have come up with a list of recommended actions along with a price, estimated price for those. This Saturday from 10 to 11.30, they will present 
the results of that study and answer questions. Um, there will be time for public commentary after it. The Zoom, it'll be all by Zoom. The Zoom link is on the town website um, under the, you know, if you go on the calendar on that date, it'll be there and you can link to the Zoom meeting. The second meeting is two weeks later. It's the 27th. Um, again, from 10 to 1130, that will be Western New England University. Um, Professor Tim Versalati, he worked with the town um, about a year ago, we did a survey of town residents asking them for their kind of opinions and feelings about mainly about buildings, but also about sort of services related to those buildings. He will be presenting the results, the tabulated results of that survey with some um, sort of background couching discussion. Um, and again, there will be time for public comment and questions associated with that. Um, I think that's it. Again, Great. Zoom. Um, I, I'm just encouraging everyone to come because I think it will be very informational and very exciting because it seems like this would be very helpful moving forward, making decisions and actually following through on some of the projects that we're hoping to accomplish pretty soon. So Julie, thank you so very much. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I'm really glad that you um, gave us an update on that. Okay, um, the, the next, well, I'll just give a quick update on the COVID um, vaccine situation. Uh, we, it's a constant struggle to figure out what we're getting every week and what we're not getting. And we're working, trying to work very hard together as a county. So, it seems like it's all last minute and it's disorganized, but it's, it is very organized considering we have no time frame. We, we, you put in an order on Tuesday, you get notification on Friday and you have to use your vaccine within a week. Um, you know, well actually 10 days, but you have to use it before you can order more. So you have to have everything out the door before you have the opportunity to order more vaccine. Every time you draw um, from a, a vial, you have potential to have nine to 11, 11 and a half, sometimes 12 doses. So at the end of the day, there are some extra doses and people are constantly worried about not, um, you know, we don't want to want to waste any. And so we're trying very hard to make sure match up needs with who haven't, wasn't able to have schedule an appointment. You can't set up the appointment. You know how much vaccine you have. It's all done on the links of the state system. And it, it's, it's a little bit more cumbersome than we're used to, but we're hoping a Greenfield, uh, we got 500 extra doses. That we, uh, Deerfield got 500 this last week for South County. And we were told we were getting 100. And that was after we were told we were getting none. And so Greenfield is handling it this week. And then next week we're starting our clinics and we're hoping Thursday and Friday, we're hoping we're gonna get verification of our allocation on Friday. The link will go up for over 75s and we're gonna start running our clinics. And because we've been doing this for a long time, and because we've been um, very lucky to have such a wonderful place like the old Channing Beat building, which is owned by Treehouse now, and they're being so generous with us, yep. we're going to have down. a wonderful, wonderful site. And, and once the vaccine becomes more available, or we get the Johnson Johnson vaccine as well, because we're handling Moderna, which you, it comes frozen, you thaw it out. You have to use it within 30 days. And if you open a vial, you have to use it within a few hours. We do, are not handling the Pfizer, which has to be held below 80 degrees below zero because we don't have that ability. So the, we have the Moderna and then we hopefully will be getting the Johnson & Johnson, which is like flu shot kind of vaccine. The Moderna does not like to be moved around. So once it's thawed, it's kind of like we've got to use it. So. Anyway, um, it, it's complicated. It's much more complicated than just whipping out the flu shots. But we have wonderful volunteers. Deerfield Academy has built more petitions. They have 
the partitions that they built for our for our foot clinic that are in the town hall. They've built some additional ones. So we're going to be able to have um, set up in the warehouse space at, at um, Treehouse Brewing. And it will, and we're going to try to do everything we can to get our community vaccinated as soon as possible. We have wonderful volunteers. Everybody's coming together. It's just awkward and hard to work on the county as as a group, and and last minute. But we're doing meeting after meeting after meeting. Everybody is trying to be cooperative, and 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 we're going to do it. I think once we get this up and running, we'll be in a lot better shape because we'll know how it goes and we're, we'll be able to uh, demonstrate our capacity to do this. Um, I think there's an, uh, a much bigger need than what we're being told there is. So I think that we really are pushing on, I mean, you should all know that we're pushing on behalf of Deerfield to have this clinic and we wouldn't have it if we did have Carolyn hadn't put in the time and really pressured the state and pressured uh, the county to make sure it's up and running and with all the, the help from our volunteers and what FERCOG is working with. So we're, uh, we've been working really hard on this for a couple of weeks, but again, it's until you, you don't, you can't really set it up until you know how many doses you're getting. We've been told we're getting none, we're getting a hundred. We're not going to get them. We're going to get them, but you got to give them away. And there's so it's, it's been a little bit of a nightmare. Um, but we're hoping that, you know, by, by the end of next week, um, Saturday, we're cleaning out the warehouse over there. Uh, it's a wonderful place, big, wide open, all concrete floor. It's going to be, be safe. It will be safe. Plenty of space. Um, I'm just so grateful to Treehouse for, for loaning this place to us. Um, 300 parking spots, really easy in and out. Um, we've got a great team set up to go. So, so uh, Saturday morning, it's going to be clean. We'll set up next week. Hopefully on the 18th, we'll be up and running and, and then we'll start to get a feel for how this goes and, and, and keep pressuring the county and the state to make sure that this stays open and we have it as often as we can. Rocky. Rocky. Uh, Trevor, the, uh, have you made any arrangements for uh, any elders that don't have any transportation to get there? Uh, we yeah, go ahead, Carolyn. Well, we're working with Triad and the Senior Center, and we're making sure that we're we're hoping that we're not missing anyone, and anyone that can't make it out, we are trying to come up with a system. Once we once we get up and running in the next couple of weeks, and and the and vaccine becomes a little bit more available on a regular, uniform delivery to the states. The states can then turn around and deliver it to us on a little bit more uniform basis. And we're hoping um, that we can come up with a system that if someone is homebound, we'll get right out there. Um, we'll get to it, them. It is in the plan. It's just that we, without the availability, knowing the availability of vaccine, it's, it's, it's very hard to do any long-term planning. And it's also, um, like I said, we want you you open this vaccine and thought, it really doesn't like to be moved around. So we're trying to figure out the best way to handle all this. Um, and we're trying, to get, we're trying to get the seniors that are out and about and, you know, out and around people and, you know, on their everyday active life or out and about, you know, first and, um, and then get a plan to get to the ones that are really not out and exposed, uh, but do have, still have people caregivers coming uh, to their home. And so still need, obviously need protection. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we've got a higher. And we're trying to get all the caregivers done. Um, you know, that, that's a phase one. We just started the phase two, which is the first group in phase two, which is the over 75. Yeah. The next group that will be coming, and then, you know, depending how fast we can get everyone through, is the over 65. Um, and we're hoping, you know, I mean, that's a huge demand. So we're hoping to be up and running by then. You know, and, and then we move to the next groups, all the next groups, the teachers and everybody yeah. like that. Yeah. Sewer treatment plant operators. So we're working, we're working on this very hard, you know, it's multiple meetings every day and um, our calls and um, so it's, it's happening. So I just yeah. want people to feel comfortable about that. They are not being left out in the cold. They have not they're not missing anything. It's just the information is very limited and it's slow coming. 
And one of the things that we are going to do tonight when we talk to Joe Comerford and Nellie Blay is that we're gonna thank them because with the whole Western Mass delegation, they pressured um, so that we actually got some vaccine. We didn't have vaccine before. Yep. So, um, we, you know, we're, the county is getting some vaccine now uh, yeah. and that's huge. Yeah. It so is. we're going to thank them, mm -hmm. but then we're going to say, you can't back off because we right. need more right. and we need the ability to keep running. And we have the demand and people want to stay in the county. They don't want to be driving down to Eastville Mall and yeah, trying to compete. You know, with if you talk about transportation issues, we're going to solve what we have here. And you can call the senior center and try to figure out your situation with the senior center. Um, or triad or, you know, we have multiple groups out there. Sharon Petrarca was really great, but mm -hmm. everybody in South mm -hmm. County will be taken care of under our EDS South County group, Frontier EDS South County group. And, um, you know, we have people working, you know, the town clerks, just like in the H1N1, the town clerks are coming together. They're helping us, you know, uh, through street listings, um, know where people are. So it's and, all, I mean, there's huge, what people have been huge told. help by town staff, volunteers, and, and, and people are really coming forward um, and taking classes because this is a new system that we're using. It's new to everybody. We had hoped to have practice this fall for our flu clinics with the prep mod that the state was going to use. It was promised to be out in the summer. It was promised to be here in the fall. Of course, it wasn't for our flu clinic. It just was operational. Um, the beginning of January. So it's, it is truly brand new. Um, so there's classes, I'm taking a class tomorrow. There's classes every week now and um, across the state. So there's, you know, it's a lot of things happening. Positive, it's coming. Mm -hmm. um, so now, um, MA, I see you're on here. Um, is there, um, from the energy point of view, we're going to be talking about our list of priorities for um, Joe and Natalie. And one, I don't want to say it's my top priority because my top priority, and we have to talk about that tonight, but the one I'm, of course, most interested in is senior center and senior housing. But climate change, um, I have to say, is huge. We had such good motive. You know, it seemed like we had a lot of momentum um, last February, a year ago. We had a lot of momentum. We had our town symposium and then COVID hit like the next week. So um, I'm just wondering why you're right on right now, if, if it's all right with Trevor and Dave, if we could just get um, some of the things that you might be aware of that we're not aware of, like um, the new energy bill. I know they like there's soil health in that and the state did not fund it. There's all kinds of problems with that new climate change bill. And so I was just wondering if you had anything you could add or you uh, wanted to add that we could talk to Joe. I'm not speaking for the energy committee, obviously. Um, oh, no, no, just yourself. Uh, well, first of all, the, from everything I've read, even though it's not a perfect bill, it needs to pass without the governor's amendments, which are, which are making it worse, not better, um, less effective. Um, so the main, the, my main message is don't, you know, don't bow down to the, to the governor on this. You've passed it twice, pass it again. Um, and then, you know, then we can keep, I mean, this is an ongoing process. Hopefully we won't wait. And like this time it was 2008. And we've made it all the way to 2021 uh, without really doing anything. Hopefully things happen a little sooner and a little closer together in the future so we can you know, continue to work on this. But um, I, it's essential. It's, it's essential to pass the bill as it is. Um, and as far as um, you know, other me messages within the town, um, I, I don't I don't have anything in particular. I mean, we're we're talk, stuff that we're doing is is pretty much. I mean, I think things are really good things are going on in the town right now. 
the zoning changes for solar are really good. The, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, but so my, my, I may be not as in, tuned in as I should be, but passing that uh, climate bill is the key for them. Thank you. Any um, updates on the landfill, MA? Any news on the landfill? Um, well, talk, we've been talking to Nexamp at the Energy Committee, and they, uh, they're encouraged. They still don't have Eversource's um, charges. They, either, they haven't got the Eversource permit yet, which is the make or break piece. Um, but they're optimistic about it. And what they think is that they will have all their ducks lined up to start construction uh, the end in, in December, assuming that the permit goes through at, at a cost that they are, can tolerate, mm -hmm. the Eversource permit. And um, if, they, if that happens, they'd start, they have everything done and start construction uh, end of, in December 2021 or January 2022 and be, have construction completed within six months. So as po possibly as early as late spring that they would be complete. Then they have to get, of course, you know, Eversource to hook them up. And that sometimes can take a long time, sometimes There's not, who knows. But that, but they think construction might be done uh, in, in the second quarter of, of uh, 2022. And Eversource was evaluating right now, part of this permit is evaluating the infrastructure along that road, can it handle, you know, the load that's going to come out of there? Where is it going to get, you know, sent to and all of that kind of stuff and, and what kind of expense they need to put well, in. Well, you know, that killed it the last time MA yeah, though. I know. And so. I don't understand that because those, that has a, a three phase system going right by the landfill. And I think that's a 17.5, which is a very high voltage system going through there. That can handle any solar. Well, but it's, I think it, it's, it's how it goes back to um, equipment further away at the, whether they, whether it can handle it. I don't really understand, but I know that Eversource, um, one of the things that happens is that, now I don't know where the set right road is connected in, whether it's the same line. Mm. And I don't know, um, but that's next amp too, so they know. Right. Um, and uh, so, but you know, Eversource, Eversource hasn't been very good in the past, in, in their past at upgrading equipment. And it's oftentimes the last person online that gets to pay for the whole thing. So, I mean, that's what killed Wendell. Um, Wendell was gonna put in a big, uh, community shared solar through Northeast Solar and, and the, the Eversource was gonna charge them multi, multiple millions of dollars. And, um, but it's, you know, you just, it's so unpredictable what Eversource is gonna come up with. It's not that anyone can really even tell what, what they're gonna do. And they usually hit the last person, the, the person who overloads with the whole bill rather than sort of trying to keep their equipment upgraded over a period of time. So yeah. it's not a shared cost gotcha. and it's, it can kill a project and, yep. and. Fingers crossed. Thank you, MA. I, I wish it was, I wish it was just a little bit more clear. Yeah. <laughs> like everything else, it's clear as mud. And thank you yeah. guys for your COVID work, um, you know, the vaccination yeah. stuff. That's really spectacular that you're doing that. Well, it's a community, it will be a community effort, just yep. like our flu clinics. And I'm very excited because the reason why we always have been successful is because people always step up and volunteer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, I just encourage people to sign up for the MRC through Mass Response, the website and, and um, we are trying to get everyone through there just to help because this is a long-term event. It's not a one weekend deal and then we're done for the year. This is gonna be ongoing for several months. So mm -hmm. we need to be a little bit more organized with our volunteers. So again, I, I got my thank everyone in the community. Oh, good. I got oh, my good. Shot. Good. Great. <laughs>
Great. Thank All right. Care. Take care. Thank you, Evan. Thank I'm going to stay you. on. All right. Take care. Okay. Um, well, the reason why I wanted to, uh, and I thank the planning board for being willing to come later, is just because I, I really wanted us to talk. We never have any opportunity to talk about priorities. And, uh, you know, uh, we talk about the senior center, we talk about senior housing. We, we, you know, there's all the town buildings we have. Um, I, we need help with that. And I, and I would like us to have that other than obviously we got COVID. We wanna make sure we have vaccine and we get COVID support and all that kind of stuff. So if, if we start off with COVID and we'll just go from there, what would you guys wanna hear us be asking them because this is our opportunity to prioritize some of our needs and get them focused. Well, one of my, you know, this has been the thing that I've been trying to get figured out is um, help with working with DOT and with the master plan for our downtown. Um, when is Sugarloaf Street going to get done? Um, when are the sidewalks going to get done on Sugarloaf Street? And how do we tie all that, that um, design work into um, revitalizing Elm Street, you know, the building that's, you know, how do we get some economic development for the Cumberland Farms building? Um, just, you know, downtown revitalization and complete street work to kind of just uh, help, you know, we, we advocated them to pass the um, bond bill. So, bond bill, the transportation bill. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the transportation bond bill. Yeah, and that was the, that was the, you know, that was what we were told by DOT that needed to happen or else, you know, really there was no money to do anything. So that has happened now. And, and so just some guidance to kind of help us through that process is, you know, grant money to kind of get that stuff going. Or, now, do uh, you want to, we, we could set up, I mean, we did have a really productive meetings with them and we could move forward with that. Yes. But we should be asking specifically what we want them to do, not just. We want them um, to build the infrastructure and take care of the, the aging needs underneath Park Street and Conway Street um, from, from the fire station through Park Street, either through this town hall, wherever that section was that they owned, um, and, and up to the light at Cumberland Farms, that infrastructure needs to be brought up to code or whatever their specs would be so that we could then take it over from the town and, and have the ability to maintain that, close off Park Street and expand the common or any other myriad of ideas, slow down the traffic. I mean, the whole idea is to really slow down traffic from flying through the center of town with kids walking across there with the work that we're gonna do on the common. Um, I would love to expand the common and, and really close off Park Street, but we have to think about how that impacts, you know, um, traffic and people coming to town. I think it would be an added bonus, um, but I'm sure there are plenty of people that'll tell me it's not. <laughs> so uh, I think I just, it also depends on the what well, you know what we do with the Leary lot. If the Leary <laughs> lot gets developed, then people will be more relaxed about downtown parking. Right, we have plenty of parking, and you can you can add the same number of parking spots by closing that street as you can by leaving it open. So there's there's ways to deal with that and still have a bigger a bigger space there. Um, uh, so, so really it's just kind of work, uh, pressure and help working with DOT to kind of see that come to fruition and, and to really pressure to get uh, Sugarloaf paved and Sugarloaf sidewalk. Um, that's really important to me. Aside from that, um, and, and again, to also just start discussing the dry bridge. Um, you know, we've got trucks can't go over that bridge and you know downtown is tight so that that needs to get back on the schedule and um you know and then the requirements have gotten larger uh we, we're you know with treehouse coming to town there's going to be a lot more traffic in town and um you know it's not very far from treehouse's dry bridge and i think people we want to be make sure that people can come into town and out of town and utilize our town and the businesses here i just think that, that those kind of infrastructure projects are, are very important to economic development in the long term. Um, so that that's important for me, along with, um, you know, trying to trying to and I'm, I'm very grateful that the state has come up with a one stop 
you know, for the grant thing, because really what's frustrated me is that, you know, we have a, a library project, but that, that can't touch anything else. And we have another project over here, but that money can't touch the library project. And, and just the, the whole way of funding things are so siloed that you can't really get projects from the state to work together to um, be much more NF, you know, energy efficient and efficient to lay out um, like one heating system to do a town hall building and the library, you know, or something like that. So we, we really need some help for, you know, coming up with our master plan for what this, what this chunk of town is going to look like, you know, the, the municipal footprint. So that, those are my large things that are on my mind of trying to figure out how to help Gearfield um, in the future. Sidewalks, infrastructure, economic development. And okay. COVID. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, well, one, you know, that I just learned about today was the new grants for closed storefronts. Yes. Um, to seeing if we can utilize that somehow to get a hold of that Cumberland Farms property. Yeah and do something with that because that's quite frankly an eyesore to the center of south deerfield yep uh the other thing i have a major concern with is the commonwealth's perpetual actions of creating hardships for the town and not funding them and that yep. being the new police reform yep that's going to cost the town of deerfield a lot of money and it's going to restrict the people that we can have on our department. Yeah, it is a big, big problem. Uh, I, I, that's definitely a priority. I, we have, we're organizing the meeting at some time for the four counties on this, but I think, I think we have to, I want to make sure we bring that up and, and we use the example of RNs and LPNs. You, it's like getting rid of LPNs just using RNs, getting rid of basic EMTs and only using paramedics. And for small towns, it's very, very difficult. I, I wanna make it clear that it's not, that we have problems with the standards so, or absolutely. certifications and certainly uh, you know, following careers well, of, of police officers that are, of are less than stellar. Part of the certification process is they're looking at 960 hours for a part-time officer. That's ridiculous. No. So what we have to do is figure out it's an implementation and the fact that the state gave us no money for that. And right. I mean, it's no, it's no different like in the climate bill is the, is the soil health, this whole thing about soil health, then not a dollar, not a dollar anywhere. In it. And this is the same thing that they've, you know, put out like a, to support the committee money, but not anything for municipalities that have to implement this. And right. I mean, and it is not one size fits all. What's, what's gonna happen is we're gonna end up with state troopers everywhere because towns can't afford police coverage, smaller towns. Mm -hmm. And then you have worse police coverage because you've gotten rid of your local people with the local knowledge and the local connections and you don't I don't know it's there's no community policing involved and I think that's a step backwards in my mind and I I lived through that when I was a police officer in Deerfield Sunderland basically didn't have the money so the state police took over the town of Sunderland at and because of the agreements that we had Deerfield ended up covering Sunderland at night Yep. until a state trooper got there. Yeah. And, you know, it's just a lot of things that, you know, fine, they work fine for the big cities and stuff, but they don't work for Western Mass. Yeah, I know. Well, there's a lot of small towns in the, I mean, there's 351 communities and the majority of them are actually under um, 10,000 10, people. So it's you know. a huge percentage of, of communities that this does not fit. And so, I feel Deerfield's in a, in a better position than, you know, some of these other smaller towns around us are yes. going to struggle. They are going to, they were just, they will not have a police department. I know. And we, we've got to figure out how we're going to deal with this because um, we just don't have the, we, nobody has wiggle room in their budgets anymore. Right. So in, 
the police, so the police reform is really a, um, in, our, in our mind is unfunded mandate. I just, again, I just, we, we need to not argue with what they were trying to achieve because I think these intentions were good. It's okay. just the way they put it together was is horrible. Okay. Um, is both so of them where do you want to see that? that? So are we, um, are we all agreeing that we we want to try to get some help for senior center and senior housing, right? Yes. Regional senior center. Yes. Regional, um, I mean, and senior housing. So that would be our first thing. And then um, the second thing, I think we have to say police reform because that's that's going to be more immediate. Mm -hmm. You know that 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 starts July 21st. I mean July 21. This July, July 21. Right. So. Um, so that would be number two. And then um, number three is, um, do we want to, we want to talk about the whole street, complete streets and stuff like that. Um, the DOT to kind of move this stuff forward. And I, I think at some point we have to bring up education because that's 70% of our budget almost. And um, you know, the state's share of the cost of educating a child is going lower and lower and lower. And I, you know, I, I MA remembers, you know, when, when I, turn of the century, remember we were out going to Boston saying the state's not paying enough for school state, you know, their state share. And it was like 36%. And now we're below 20%. So it's, it's getting pretty ridiculous. And, um, we're going to, I hope, hopefully our waiver is going to pan out and we won't lose money um, under the new ed form reform bill, but there's really got to be some more effort that money has to come out on the table for education. Um, so we need to list that. And, and then, then like I said, I was going to talk about the climate change. We need to make sure that the climate bill gets passed. As MA has pointed out, and I pointed out, it's not perfect, but we, we really got to get going on stuff because we, and that's part of, I was going to ask to make sure that they get adequate funding for the um, MVP program, because that is user friendly for the communities, but it's getting so competitive now right. that, I mean, it was, it was great when Deerfield was the first community certified and we were getting it round after round after round. But um, it's very competitive now, and um, and they're cutting back on the on the amounts of grants per community, you know, the dollar amounts. Right. And all the projects that we have are hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like repair, there's two or three places on River Road that need to be repaired. Yeah. So, yes, Ma. Um, it seems to me the baseline of all of these conversations is they need to figure out how to raise more money. Yeah. Yes. And, and, uh, you know, so uh, my, my suggestion is talking about a progressive, a more progressive taxing system. I don't know whether anyone's willing to listen to that, but every single one of these projects is saying, we need more money, you need to fund that you need to do this, but what they're doing is funding less and less and less, because they, they're cutting taxes all the time, or they're, you know, or whatever, but they've got to change their tax system. And uh, good luck with that, but that's the baseline for the whole thing. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I I have to say I agree with you on that. I we just need more money, and and so that they do need to raise more money somehow. I I can honestly say, um, you know, my husband works in Pennsylvania. My honest, they they tax a lot more out in Pennsylvania than they do here in Massachusetts now. Massachusetts mm -hmm. might have had a bad name, but it's not, it's not that true anymore. I think, Trevor? I think also is the relationship they have with their federal uh, colleagues. And, you know, Massachusetts pays so much in taxes, right, to, to the federal government and gets a whole lot less money, especially since, you know, the, the last administration got rid of any ability to claim your, your interest on your house. Um, you know, the, the the blue states, I'll just put in quotes, but the, Nor the, the New England states are, are shoveling money to southern and western states, like in wheelbarrow fulls. 
and um, it needs to kind of turn around. I mean, you look at New York, there are $30 billion left New York in the last four years, 30 billion. And, uh, you know, they're asking for 15 back. I think that, you know, our governor and our people need to step up. I mean, we have strong people on strong boards right now representing Massachusetts. They need to use that power and bring home some, some help. I mean, what are you there for? Not to bring home the help to the, to the, to the towns you represent and, and, and the state you represent. There's, there's, there's economic development that needs to happen. We were looking at a $19 million sewer project that Deerfield is paying for. I mean, we have some help from the federal government, but it's, you know, considering when they did things in the 70s, they stepped up and did, you know, and hit the ball out of the park and funded this, you know, we're talking about climate, but you're, you know, they funded uh, the EPA, which put in all these sewer systems all up and down Rivers. I was just going to say, I think it's really what you're talking about is infrastructure, uh, yep. and that covers the road infrastructure projects for roads, um, sewer systems, water districts. I mean, the whole thing. Yes. Um, so I think that actually that's really and, good. And, and how they communicate with their federal partners huh, to drive. Yeah. Down. I mean, they have more sway than we do. So it'd be yes. nice. Yes. I mean, I know it's in their hierarchy of fish, but it's still, uh, you know, whatever that can be done to move some money back to Massachusetts, it'd be great. Okay. Um, can you think of anything else we're missing in general? I mean, there's a ton of stuff, but. There's a ton. I know they're working on the sewer thing. There's a meeting coming up, um, sewer and water. So that's, I mean, they're doing a lot of good things and um, it's just. Speaking of which, um, why, before we forget um, that, Sewer meeting is um, the 24th, which is our select board meeting. So yes. do you, Dave, do you know, do you want to meet on the 23rd or the 24th? I mean, the 25th? 25th. I didn't know what, what you were available. Yeah. I know I registered for that sewer infrastructure meeting. Yeah, me too. Okay, so we don't have a quorum. I'm, I'm okay for the 25th. Okay. Oh, okay. So Casey, could you um, post our select board meeting that would normally would be posted for the 24th? Could you post it for the 25th? Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. You want to do a few of these discussion things before they show, or do you have anything else on that? Um, yeah, so is there anything else anyone wanted to talk? Does any, I don't, Rocky, anybody? Um, I don't know who else is on, oh, Annalee or, okay. Um, well, let's do a couple agenda items while we're waiting then. Okay. Um, the Hatfield 350th notification. Yes. Are we gonna- so that's that's so the email requested um, whether asked whether you wanted to participate, but it also leads directly to a recognition of um, their 350th. So I created a certificate of recognition, which you guys can take a look at. Um, they outline in the email what the how they plan to run the parade, which I thought was really interesting. So I guess you need to discuss how you would participate, whether you wanted to participate. There, something doesn't seem right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, you said May. It's an email. It's not a regular letter. Thirtieth, a Sunday would be the would be the. Yes, I saw the um, I saw the the Commonwealth of uh, the um, certificate of recognition, which which kind of says, uh, be it resolved that the select board here hereby recognizes the 350th anniversary of the incorporation of the town of Hatfield and extends its appreciation and congratulations for the valuable contributions of the res residents to overall success and quality of life of the region and in the Commonwealth. Um, so given this day, the 10th of February, 2021. So that would be the recognition we would send. And then I, I would like to partake in their parade on the 30th. I don't, you know, 
It doesn't conflict with um, our parade if we're going to have it. I mean, I don't know if we're going to have a parade this year, but um, because it is on a Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it makes sense. Um, and that is. Okay. Is that that must be. What's that? Yeah, that's Memorial Day weekend, right? Yeah. I yes. believe so. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, I would like to, I would like to participate. I mean, we'd love to have them at, at ours. So, you know, I think we, we need to represent if we can. Well, I mean, this is no different than participating in Sunderland's. Yes. Um, we participated in Sunderland's. So I, I feel like we should. Yep. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can't think of a, of a parade, participating in the parade right now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, we need to have a tickler on this because the time goes by so wicked fast. So, yeah. um, Casey, can you put this on the agenda for sometime oh, next month so that we can follow up on how we're going to organize our participation? Yeah. Okay. If that's all right with you, Dave, is that all right with you? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm free on the 30th, but. Okay. Actually, is it, that's not Memorial Day weekend, is it? I think so. It's this. It is. I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, Memorial Day is Monday. That's not the 24th. Yes. No. Um, Memorial Day weekend. I mean, Memorial Day is the 31st, okay. and then uh, 30th is a Sunday. They yeah. did say we'd uh, love to have your town join in our parade. Um, you can bring your own vehicles to ride in, or create a float and uh, and tow it with town officials in cars be creative uh this one is mobile so um i guess the idea is that due to COVID 19 they will be they won't be having a normal parade this time the parade will be ro a rolling parade with no marching units the parade will be run over a seven mile course traveling through town it's being promoted as a don't come to downtown parade we're going to bring the parade to you so i think that's I kind think of it's really cute yeah i think so, it's funky I, I think we need to figure out something, yes. And they um, said they can help if we needed a flatbed or something like that. So, uh, or, you know, maybe maybe they would have a flatbed to tow or, I, I don't know. I know that uh, Savage was wonderful last time for Sunderland's and that was really fun to decorate and, and get towed around, but I don't know if he'd be up for that again. Um, and and we might not be able so, to do that. I don't, Or somebody you know, else might, people, might be willing. We I could, mean, we were sitting on the thing together, remember, so. I don't know. Out on, a, on a big Hopefully flat we'll be bed. Able to... We're all going to be vaccinated, right? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> dreaming, right? We're dreaming. Yeah. We just want to uh, get back to real life. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's put it on the agenda for next month because I, okay. honestly, I just can't think of it right now. Yep. Um, so I think we have a couple more minutes here. So I, I would like to make sure that we get through the town meeting discussion. Um, I'm so I'm sure everyone saw the emails that Casey was sending around. It makes total sense that we use the same time frame after, um, you know, frontier graduation. So we minimize setup and take down and all that kind of stuff. Oh. So, so what, um, I didn't get to read those. What, what was the oh, box? So basically I sent an email out and asked Scott Dredge and Dan Graves and Lisa and Barbara um, and uh, several other people, Bill Hildreth, about when we could schedule in June. And Scott's response to me was June 12th. Okay. It's the Saturday after graduation, I think. Oh. But it's it's a time frame that they have open. They have other things going on in the, the few weeks before and the few weeks after. Yeah. So this is the date that he could nail down. And so then I found out that Sunderland is having their town meeting the same day at four o'clock. They're doing it in Sunderland. Of yeah. course, yeah. on the field behind the town hall. So what I did was I asked Dan today and a couple days ago, I had asked him kind of what a time frame he was looking at once I realized that we need to schedule around Darius having to be in two different meetings on the same day. And so that. Dan's, exactly, he's got to be at both meetings. So Dan's comment to me was, ask the board to set the date and then we'll work out the time okay. because the logistics of it include dealing with weather. 
yeah. because Darius's comment, I don't know if you read it, but Darius's comment was, it gets really hot out there as you get later into the morning, so you might want to start at like nine. Yeah. And I hadn't really thought about that, so I thought it was a good comment. Um, yeah. We also need to keep in mind that, and I sent Chris Collins a separate email about this, we need to keep in mind that FCAT does the video out for these two meetings, so they need to be able to get from place to place as well. Right. Um, so my request to the board is to set the meeting date of the 12th of June and see if and can... then set a planning meeting for Dan and several other people to sort of chime in. Because yeah. Dan has some concerns about being able to see people if we have tents and stuff. So I'll try to work. And if oh. you, uh, he really wants to discuss time if we need to, yeah. but he really wants you to do the date first. Okay. So I would make a motion to um, set the annual town meeting for June 12th, 2021. And I would second that. Is there any further discussion or are you all set with that, Dave? Obviously, a flexible okay. to change it if, if everything falls apart, no one could yeah. pull it off. That's fine. Right. I, I just agree that we should do it in the morning because, it you know, with some some days in June get really, really hot. Mm -hmm. already um and, and so least, if there's no further discussion all those in favor i trevor mcdaniel i dave wolfram i carolyn ness okay Let's give us enough time to you know get things worked out for our, for our budget and all that stuff so that yeah that's, right that's right yeah. um the next item on the agenda is the cares act covid uh response amendment that's the additional money um that we owe for uh tracing contact tracing yes um, it's for the should, contact tracing, yes. And I, I would recommend that we sign this. Um, how much, uh, do we know how much that they're requesting? It's, I don't have the bill in front of me. Let me see if I can find it real quick um, in my email. There was, there was a, it's over the 11,000 that we had estimated. So I know that, um, so there were a couple it does, of things. It does, Trevor, it does include the spike, the, you know, the surge. No, I get that. No, I'm not. I'm not we got uh, it in January. My question was, there were two requests, one for, um, you know, paying up what we owe, and then the other was for amending the M M MOU and asking... Um, that we agreed to pay more, I know. I, I so, don't... There were two questions. Yeah, two yeah. Requests, there's, like, well, there's two parts to it, and, and I wanted to make sure that we paid the part that we owed. Right. Which is more than it's more than eleven thousand now, isn't it, Casey? It is. So the last bill we got was from October through December twenty twenty, and it's almost eleven thousand dollars. Right. Um, we haven't even gotten January and this far into February. No, so ahead. we're way above what we had set as an estimate in the original agreement. Right. I'm yes. going to shoot this to you, Trevor, because I can't share the way you can. Okay. So I'll shoot you the email. Um, so there's three things. The invoice is provided for this time period. You'll see it when you get it. Yep. Um, and this is me reading through Phoebe's email. Um, she also sent us for some reporting information so we can input that into our CARES Act reporting template, which we yep. have to use a certain, we have to do this a certain way. And then the amendment to the CARES MOU between the health district and the town brings into alignment the extended CARES Act timeframe beyond 1231, 2020, and allows, us to comp allows them to continue to provide that contact tracing resource that we need. Um, so it does, it, it just serves a dual purpose. It acknowledges that the CARES Act was extended. It acknowledges that the money we estimated was not was an estimate and that we're expending more money than we anticipated. And it also um, continues the relationship so we can have that contact tracing. I, okay. I still think um, our numbers are coming w way down, but um, so our estimates should be that we estimated on the average was based on higher numbers, you know, in November and December. So it will cost less, but it will still will cost more than if, we went with community tracing, right? Uh, compact. But I have to tell you, 
you know, the difference of being able to decide, you know, uh, uh, when the number comes in, oh, they come in during the day, all day or night, or whatever. But having the fact that someone is looking at it besides just me and, and it's action is being taken yeah. and it's, it's happening true. and it, it's immediate, people are reaching out and it's immediately followed up. There's not the 24 or 36 hour delay or more. Um, and also there's basic community knowledge and the, every, all the, the FERCOG tracers know if there's any issues, if they get no response or, or, or people are not cooperative, then they can hand it to me and I go out and I do it and, um, and make sure that we have answers and follow up. And um, so I feel very strongly that to, to go to the, it is a free service, but it's, it's, it's useless because if we, if we don't, if you don't follow up and you don't know what your, what the cases are, there's no way you can contain them. So right. why would you even bother doing it? No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, okay. So, so I'm, I'm okay. All yeah. right. I, I just, Dave, do you feel comfortable with that decision too? Yeah, I do. It's, okay. It's, you know, it's money we have to spend. And, and so. Casey, we, we still have enough in the um, CARES to, to handle that. We are carefully monitoring CARES. In fact, I put a spending freeze out when we started right. because FEMA hadn't gotten back to us. Right. Um, so this was the key bill to be able to pay. Yeah. So Important. we paid this bill. It was just shy of, a, it was 10,995, right. I think is, is the bill if you look at it. Right. Um, there's going to be more because we still have the uptick in January to take care of as well. So yes, that that the the uptick is going to cost us more money, but the exactly. But it's come down. So they had only estimated around eleven thousand dollars for the entire time period from I think July to December. Yep. And we of course didn't know until a few weeks before the extension that it was actually going to be extended through the federal government, the act itself. Yep. So um, this will solve some of those problems. I don't know what that next bill is going to look like. They tend to bill in quarterly. So yeah. we won't know until a few weeks from now. Okay. So um, are you look, you're looking for a motion to? Yes, please. Okay. So make a motion to approve the extended CARES action to sign the MOU extension with um, the community coalition through the FERCOG for contact tracing until July 1st, 2021. Dave Wolfram second it. Okay, thank you. Is there any further discussion on that? No. Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Thank you both for supporting um, yes. um, this decision. I think it's, it's the best for our community. Um, okay, I see that I both believe... Joe, Yes, yeah, Joe and Natalie are here. here. Hey, and Joe. We, we just want to say welcome, welcome. Yes, welcome. There she is. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, we want to start out by saying thank you so very much for um, working hard to make sure that we have vaccine in Franklin County. Um, you know, there was a huge difference from one week to the next week. <laughs> And I really attribute it to um, you all reaching out. We're working together as a county, and um, but by you banding together with our other legislators out here, we were able to do you know have vaccine available. So again, I can't thank you enough for starting up and going and having local clinics. And it is very hard for people in Franklin County to have to go down to you know, Eastfield Mall and places like that. You know, it's just really, especially when you're talking about the older 70, over 75 group and even the over 65 group. This is, you know, it's bad weather, it's a long distance. And well, so it's, we, it's really nice, thank you. We've been And we don't have internet access. So, you know, having a little extra time to sign people up is also very helpful. And I, yeah. I really attribute that to both of you, so thank you. And we have been training on this for, you know, for a long time and we need to take care of our own here, um, you know, instead of kind of all of us trucking down to another county with a ton of people in it that already are backed up. So 
Um, I just think we have an amazing opportunity through Treehouse at the Channing Health Beat uh, building. Um, very safe, large. Uh, it's going to be a very nice place to be able to to make this happen for our residents. So I can't thank you enough for again advocating for us and uh, making that happen. Yeah. Yes, we've been we've been working well over 15 years. We've had you know we have eight different plans. This is now the Treehouse Brewing Plan is now our ninth plan, and um, we have great volunteers. Um, you know, all the towns, all South County towns pulled together. And um, so we, we were really able to do it. And it was very, very frustrating to have no vaccine to be able to set our emergency dispensing site up after all these years. It's like, this is what we've been doing this for. And we have all the equipment, we have refrigerators, we were all set. So um, thank you very much. Um, so how did you, if you, um, I know you don't, you have limited time and I don't know how you want to set this up, but we do have a list of priorities. <laughs> and um, so would you like to tell us what you've been doing and then give us and have us tell you our priorities or what would you like us to do? What works for the town? Oh, we'd love to hear from you. It's been a while uh, since we've been together. So yeah. uh, I mean, my, my vote is to just hear what you've been up to and uh, then we can tell you what we're working on. Super. Okay. Super. Natalie, do you want to kick off? Sure. Uh, well, it's, first of all, it's great to see you all. And we so appreciate you giving us some time here tonight, uh, not only to quickly brief you on what we've been up to and what we're hoping uh, to focus on in the 192nd session, uh, but more importantly, to hear directly from you about the challenges that you're facing on the ground. So I just want to thank you for setting aside time for us tonight. Um, and you mentioned this, this vaccine rollout. I want to just take a minute and going to make Joe uncomfortable, uh, but she's just been a tremendous leader, not only in this region, but across the entire Commonwealth when it has come to public health and looking at our response to COVID-19. So I just want to say, Joe, what you've been able to do in your very first term has been spectacular and it has been incredible to work alongside you. I'm so grateful that, that you're playing that role on the Senate side and just want to, yes. Give you a shout out there. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get my turn, you guys, about Natalie. So we can. <laughs> we just come to these events, these meetings to embarrass each other. Um, so, you know, just a couple of things over the last session that I wanted to, you know, in terms of successes that we were able to to accomplish as a result of working alongside you. Um, one of them was we were able to secure $500,000 for buy locals across the Commonwealth, which funded CESA, you know, one of our homegrown local successes. I was really proud to work alongside the delegation to be able to get that funding for them. Uh, we were able to pass a bill that allows for ag commissions to have a say in board of health regulations that, that are going to impact agriculture, which really encourages that conversation and formalizes that process, which I think is super important in our rural communities. Uh, we were able to work together to get the Rural Schools Commission into the Student Opportunity Act, where we're looking at low and declining enrollment uh, specifically and how that's impacting many of our rural schools. In terms of infrastructure, uh, the municipal pavement program is a new $100 million program uh, that was put into place in this last year that I'm hoping um, a number of communities can take advantage of across the Commonwealth. This is for state numbered routes. And then there's the rural infrastructure program, which was originally funded at $10 million and we were able to get it. And Senator Adam Hines and, and Joe Comerford certainly led the way on the set aside to bring that up to $20 million. Uh, to, to fund rural infrastructure projects. And you'll see that this is being rolled out in the, in the new MassWorks one-stop application. This is one of the new programs that's being included in there. So definitely pay attention to that to see if there are any projects that you might be able to fund through that program because it is a significant chunk of money that we need to make sure we're directing to our rural communities. Um, looking forward, uh, Transportation is, is an important thing to me, and I know it's important to all of you. Look, the governor has just proposed Chapter 90 be level funded at uh, 200 million. We want to see if we can get that up to 300 as we tried to do last year. Um, I'll be introducing legislation to begin to look at 
it's not it's not really exciting, but it certainly impacts a lot of communities in the first Franklin district uh, dirt roads and the amount of money that our communities are spending to maintain dirt roads, particularly as we're seeing changes in climate and our freeze thaw cycles happening on and off a little bit more quickly than they have in the past and how much more money you're spending on materials to ensure that those ro roads are maintained properly. The other thing I'm hoping to advance this session is um, you all know that when you have an Uber or a Lyft ride that you're getting a big chunk of change back from the state. Uh, <laughs> some towns are getting a whopping 10, 10 cents. Yep. And, uh, and that's something that you have to submit an annual report for and also have to appropriate if you wanna use that 10 cents. Uh, so we're trying to advance legislation that would relieve you of those reporting requirements in that burdensome time consuming task that you really shouldn't have to be doing. Uh, so, so those are just a, a sample of, of what we've been working on, what we were able to accomplish in the last session. And there's a number of other things I know will, there's a dog coming in my way, uh, and a number of things that will <laughs> talk with you tonight about your priorities and that can help drive the conversation too. Thank you. Um, so I'll just pile on what Natalie said and just to, in terms of thanks for giving us this time and really thanks for your service. Um, Natalie and I talk all the time about how hard it is to be a local health, a public health official, a local town official um, during this crisis. It is, we, we see the kind of pressure you're under and so grateful for your service. And my gosh, Deerfield is lucky um, to have this brain trust. Um, you know, Natalie started by uh, <laughs> making me blush. Let me just say um, that Natalie Blay is one of the finest representatives, I think maybe the finest working in the Commonwealth today. Um, she hit the ground running with absolute speed and skill um, and has left a wake of winds behind her and a lot of good relationships and a lot of goodwill uh, for Western Massachusetts. So um, it's nothing but a joy uh, that you, you sent us back again. So thank you. Um, for, for that for that partnership with Natalie. Um, so as Natalie said, right, a part of what this last year has been, especially for me, has been COVID focused since the Senate president asked me to lead the Senate's COVID response. And, you know, I don't know that I expected um, to, to get that piece of work, but I really will say my team and I rose to it. Um, and we focused on everything statewide, as Natalie said, from testing to contact tracing to PPE to supply chain issues, working very, very closely with Secretary Sutters. Um, and of course now vaccines. Um, and I just wanna say up front, I, I, the vaccine rollout has been really difficult, especially as we bridge into phase two. I know you know that better than I do. Um, and while I, you know, while I'm, I have to focus on the state, you know, for, on behalf of the Senate, boy, I've focused on Western Mass really with a regional equity eye um, in partnership with Natalie on all these things, um, because we have to fight for our fair share. We have to fight for what's right for rural, especially rural Franklin County. Um, and that's been, you know, that's been a piece of work that's certainly not done. You're right, Carolyn, we've seen more vaccine and we saw it quickly, um, uh, but we still don't have a mass vaccination site. We still are on the map. We're absolutely, we jumped up um, many percentage points in a week and a half, but it's not yet. Um, the kind of uh, rate of vaccinations that I think we deserve. And we don't have the resources yet to go the last mile for the most vulnerable um, uh, among us. And so that's the work ahead that I'll do with Natalie. In terms of, you know, just some highlights of the last year when we weren't <laughs> focused on COVID. Um, Carolyn, I remember an early conversation with you about mosquitoes and mosquito districts. And wouldn't you know that the mosquito bill came to public health and I remember when you talked to me about it, I thought, mm, I need to know more because Carolyn wants to talk about mosquitoes. Well, I can come to you now telling you I know about mosquitoes um, and mosquito districts. And so, you know, I really actually, I'm, I'm, again, I'm proud of my team. We got this bill. It was a, the governor's bill. I thought it was the wrong bill, right? It basically said, we're yes, going to wherever we want, whenever we want, for however long we want, um, for the end of time. Um, and I remember, Carolyn, your head, your voice was in my head. Um, by the second I read that bill, and I thought, oh, wow, Carolyn's going to hate this bill. <laughs> this is, the, yeah. wrong, this yeah. is the wrong bill. And so we had to go to work. And um, I think we passed a good bill 
Um, and I think the, the best part about it was this mosquito task force for the 21st century, which we're now on, because um, I'm still technically the chair of public health. And I do think it gives us an opportunity to rethink um, rethink how our state uh, does this piece of work, but you know, around mosquitoes, but this piece of work is really a microcosm for all of the other ways the state relates to, uh, especially small towns. So that was a piece of work. Um, I also focused with Sen Senator Cindy Friedman on a lot of telehealth provisions, which were in the um, Patients First Act. And I was happy about those. They passed out of public health. And I heard from a lot of folks, and especially in Franklin County, um, where there's internet, I totally get it, and where there's cell service, to also totally get the irony there. But you know, the hope is that over time it will really open up much more equitable healthcare um, for our people. Um, I also, with Natalie, spent a ton of time on education funding. Um, we got this um, piece of um, legislation into, in addition to the the um, rural schools work um, that Natalie was so great in, we got a piece of work to look at education funding and look at the disproportionate way in which uh, Western Mass towns pay a disproportionate share of what the state tells us we can and should pay um, versus our Eastern Mass uh, counterparts. It's shocking. And so for the first time, sort of using prop two and a half as one of the levers, um, we forced the state to look at that. Um, we're now in conversations with the auditor to do a deeper dive because there's such an unfair quality to the way in which the state um, generates those numbers. And, and then we pay those numbers because it, they put a cap on it. So the wealthy communities get capped and they could pay two, three, five, ten 10 times more um, than we can. And that's just not fair. So we've got to stop that. And the report said, you got to raise, you got to lift the cap. The wealthy towns have to pay hundred yep. um, percent. So there's some momentum there. Um, I'm going to also focus on special education uh, because in the student opportunity act, that was a piece of work that just wasn't covered um, as it should have been. Right, we have uh, 20 of the 24 cities and towns in the Hampshire Franklin Worcester district have uh, special education percentages <laughs> that far exceed the assumed 17%. Mm -hmm. um, and that means municipalities pay. And I know you wanna pay, you wanna educate your kids excellently, um, but it's the, bur the burden falls on the town instead of with the state where it belongs. Um, and then I guess I'll just say super quickly, looking forward, you know, uh, Natalie and I are working on route two rail, um, the study, the study prospectus is ready. Um, that's very exciting. We're expecting it to be released soon. And so, you know, the, we got that passed early in the first year. Um, and so we'll look at the possibility of restarting passenger rail along the Route 2 corridor, you know, with stops in places like Greenfield. Um, and, you know, we'll just look at the kind of economic benefit, the environmental benefit that that could possibly have on our region. Um, and lastly, I'll just say, I'm gonna laser focus on public health. Um, you know, COVID taught us anything. It taught us that we, the sort of rife inequities and uh, that we've been experiencing before COVID just were exposed for everybody to see. And one of the inequities is the way that we fund local public health. Um, we've just decimated the infrastructure. We've put the burden on the shoulders of the people um, and we need them most now. Uh, during the COVID crisis. So I have a bill called the State Action for Public Health Excellence um, 2.0, because we passed 1.0 um, in the last session. And it's really, I think, possibly could transform the way we do public health. It'll guarantee funding to towns um, so that it won't be an unfunded mandate. It'll set training standards. It'll set um, public health standards. It'll help regionalize. It'll help share services. It'll set up a data collection system. So there's a lot of good stuff. Um, if we can win it, uh, and it's launching tomorrow. So um, I'm excited about it. Good. Yeah, we well, thank you. Um, we, I know you have limited time, so we want to, MA summed it up. We're, we're just asking for more money, and you got to figure out a way to raise more money. So we'll get into our priorities. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I, but I do think, you know, all, all kidding aside, I think it really, we do need to have a little bit funding, more additional funding. And if it's never popular to have progressive um, taxes, but I, I, I really think we need to have more progressive taxing, um, whether it's in, you know, something along the income tax line or what, but we need more money on the municipal level. We're really getting squeezed. Um, so getting a lot, I think what our biggest priority 
right now, our immediate priority is to try to do something with our senior center. As you mentioned, um, the pandemic really um, uh, accelerated all the trends that were happening and our senior center really um, is inadequate and it, it's, it's an old building and, there, and it, we have not updated it the way we should have. And so we um, were gifted the church and we have, so we have the whole corner down on by the town hall and um, we're, we really want to have a, uh, some kind of regional senior center. And um, so, but it's so hard to do that kind of project because it is so, I mean, we're, we're talking multi millions of dollars. So if there's a way that we can apply for a grant, um, the towns would step up and, and, you know, and match, but, you know, we do need some help. And, the, and it would be South County. And I think we are working so, I mean, we all work together so well with Conway um, and on multiple different things that, you know, eventually maybe Conway would end up um, participating as well. Um, but, but certainly Sunderland, Waitley and Deerfield wanna work together. And then I think the second thing that's right in there is senior housing. We've tried for years and years. I mean, the first committee meetings that Lily, um, Dwight, and I were on um, were the last century, and uh, you know it's pretty sad that we haven't been able to get that. We've gotten so close several times, and every time we turn around, there's you know the funding collapses or the programs change, the governor changes, and the priority changes or something, and it, it's just been it's been very frustrating and we really, I feel like senior housing is very needful in town, affordable senior housing, affordable senior housing, um, um, you know, subsidized senior housing. So, um, and, and we have town property, we have um, space that we could probably do it. So um, I think that's a really important. Um, the next thing that has come up on our radar is police, the police reform bill that is actually um, taking effect this July, and we're we don't disagree with the intent, you know, the whole certification, the tracking, and all that. That's that's really, you know, we're fine with that. But um, what what is happening? I think the easiest way to explain it um, is that this bill takes makes you use RNs instead of LPNs, and makes you use paramedics only instead of you know, trying to supplement with your basic EMTs. And um, for us as small communities, this is a huge, huge unfunded mandate um, to not have part-time policing. And I think it really is to the detriment of our communities because what's gonna happen is the majority of these small communities who cannot um, use part-time police officers will end up using state troopers. And, and, and that removes the whole community connection that removes local knowledge and local ability for hiring. And, you know, for, for me, it would be a real downgrade for the quality of, the, of our police force and for what we really want to see is community policing. So again, huge costs, the training, the, the whole, um, you know, I wanted to be certified years and years and years ago. Um, and I was ended up, after we investigated it and the number of hours involved, um, it wasn't worth for small departments. You picked out like your use of force, you put, picked out your pursuit policies and you updated and you'd use those kind of parts of the certification process and made sure that you were always updating those and did all that. But it's, it's just a sheer volume of all the other um, paperwork. I mean, I think, didn't John say it was 960 hours or something? Yeah. I, I don't know. It's, it's a yeah. huge yeah. amount of time that was would be dedicated to just showing that you are meeting the certifications. And again, it's not funded. And so you're taking your police officers off of patrol or off of other duties that they're already doing. And it's a huge burden for small departments that don't have that many people. So I'm, I'm just saying um, that it, we as a select, select board association have been really concerned. So Franklin County is inviting the other three um, counties together for a big four county meeting on how um, we, you know, how we're feeling this is a problem 
and how we'd like to work with our delegation to try to overcome some of these. We're gonna invite Barnstable and a few of the other communities, but I would say like an example would be Charlemont um, is, a, is one I can think of right off the top of my head. You know, they have summer, you know, all your rafting and all your things up on the Deerfield River. So they use a, a, a huge amount of part-time police officers for, you know, um, a very short period of time. And, you know, that if they had to have full-time police officers for that, it, just, it wouldn't be, you know, it's not affordable. So, and it, and it really is a safety issue. So I, I, I just think that people, you know, these bills are very, um, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And for us, that's a huge um, problem. Mm -hmm. um, Trevor and Dave, please, please um, jump in if there's anything else you want to say on that. Um, no, I, 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 would, I think I would say, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, we appreciate the intention. We, you know, we understand that there was a lot of pressure this summer, right? I mean, the, the world changed. Um, when they saw George Floyd uh, murdered, right? And so there was a lot of, and, and this has been building for a long time. So you've had a lot of um, pressure to to answer this glaring problem. And and then so there was a lot of pressure to do something. And I think, and I think of, if I think of Deerfield, I'm trying to think of what needs to, what needs to be fixed. And, um, and I think we do a very good job. We have a very excellent police chief who reaches out and is always trying to, you know, bring up the younger kids in the community, um, uh, seeing, seeing a young adult to kind of bring him into, a, into the fold. How does he work out? Let's train him. Let's send him to the part-time police academy. Let's watch him. Let's, let's ride with him, build him up into a, to a, a candidate that we could then make that big investment to take him out of our system, send him to go get trained for, for month, you know, um, and then, and then bring them back and 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 hopefully keep them in Deerfield. You know, a lot of times you you make all this investment, they're going, well, I can make more money in another town. I'm thanks for the training, goodbye, and they you know head off and leave. Um, so so I think that we're very concerned. And and then my biggest concern is, as Carolyn touched on, is that we are going to end up losing some of that connection of the, you know, the older retired, um, you know, was close to retirement guy just wants to put in a few hours and it helps fill out some of those shifts. So we don't have a lot of overtime and, um, and, but he has a connection to the community. He's kids, you know, kids, grandkids have grown up here and he can do, he can walk that street and knows those people and sit and talk with them. And, and, um, and I'm afraid that if we start losing that, we're just having, you know, we can only afford so many. So we may have some shifts not covered um, or you have the state police come in They're They're well, love state police. I mean, no knock. It's just that they're not in the community, you know, every day, you know, their kids are not in the school and, and, and they may be in, in certain areas, but on, on the whole, you know, they're coming out of Shelburne, they're coming out of Northampton and they're not like in our community as our, as our residents. And, um, actually better not say that Trevor, we have a ton of state troopers. I, know we do. <laughs> I don't mean it in that sense. Just saying, it's, it's not the same as our as our it's local. It's not police the same officers. as your, your homegrown yeah. police. You know that that are that are you're you're um you're investing in those those people to kind of come up through the system. And you know Dave could speak to this a lot more than me because I'm he's walked these shoes. You know, and I, I have not, but I just see that um, the way that John runs the runs our department and which does reach out quite a bit to the other communities. We have a major concern. So, yeah. Dave, you want, I'll let you. The. Uh... You know, I served as a part-time officer in Deerfield for 14 years. Um, and that uh, I lived through the period when Sunland didn't have a police department because of certification requirements and state police had to respond. Uh, because of the mutual aid agreement, we actually were covering Sunland at night. Um, at, uh, and here again, it's all, at the time I was doing it, this is all people that just wanted to serve the community. And that's what we're looking for now is people that want to serve the community. And some of the restrictions on this, I realize that, you know, a number of our part-time officers now are grandfathered under the bill, but the new and upcoming people, the 960 hours is cost prohibitive for somebody that's going to be working, you know, $16 an hour and, and just part-time. 
and it's um, and we've got to get these younger people involved with it. You know, it's uh, we start putting a lot of restrictions on it, and unfortunately, you're not going to have the young people getting in it. It's um, and you're going to be like, you know, I yeah. Again, it it we don't have problems with the bills itself. It's really um, it, it really comes down to that. Um, we want to make sure we have community connection, and we have we have people that we the best people that we can we can hire. And um, you know they do they start out part time and they're really young and 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 then they're mentored to, to the system and and then we you know cho choose to hire them if if we feel that they're really great. And um, I don't know I I, I just. I have always felt so strongly for community policing, and I know that's sort of like a catch-all, but the idea is that the people have a relationship with our police force. Our police force knows our community and watches out for our community and does multiple things. I mean, our police officers right now are signing up our seniors on the links because they can't, you know, they're not computer savvy or they don't have internet connection at the homes because you know, it's an additional cost or whatever. So it's it's our triad group working with our police officers that are signing up our seniors so they can get vaccine. I mean, they're, in the, but that's just one example of how they always help. Our police officers will be at our emergency dispensing site to make sure the flow of traffic is safe and we, and we can vaccinate people. Um, I mean, we, year after year after year, um, you know, we do, eight or 900 vaccines in a four hour period of time in our drive throughs And the only reason it's so safe is, is because we have police officers that are willing to, you know, step forward and work with us as a community. We, you know, our Halloween rides and all, I mean, all the events that the police officers do for, you know, in our community is part of that whole process of community policing. And, and I'm just really worried that um, this is going to make this not happen anymore. And and it, it, it's unintended. I, I know it is unintended, but we, we've got to sort this out. Um, and, and just to add, yeah. to that, it's just, you know, I can't say I couldn't be any more prouder of our current chief, John Pachurik, mm -hmm. and what he has done with the town of Deerfield's police department. Actually, he's made it such a premier department we're losing people to the ATF, Secret Service, state police, and other federal agencies because they recognize the quality of personnel that we're hiring and we're ensuring that they're training in Deerfield. So, you know, it's, it's. I mean, yes, it is part of it. A real good force. <laughs> well, it's part of it because we have been successful and that's yeah. why it's, you know, for us, this will have be detrimental in the long run because we have been successful, um, at, you know, with our police department. But anyway, moving on. And just say he's also a tremendous advocate for the town and certainly for chiefs across the region. <laughs> yes. Uh, and and I I have spoken with him about this. Uh, Joe and I have spoken um, about getting a very you know, detailed. What are the concerns mm -hmm. uh, and bringing those to leadership in Boston to make sure that there is an understanding of the concerns that we're hearing on the ground right here in Western Massachusetts. And so I don't know if you wanna say anything more about the conversations you've had. Sure, yeah, I just wanna I want to echo what Natalie was saying about the chief um, and his clear call to action. And I really I appreciate all of the things that you're raising tonight um, and just the complexities that you're dealing with. So Natalie, Natalie and I have both done this due diligence, but on the Senate side, I reached out to the bill's authors I reached out to the Senate president and chair of uh, Senate Ways and Means and, you know, um, got back, you know, I think very compelling um, messages that said, okay, they want to tune in here. They certainly, this was not uh, a consequence they wanted um, mm -hmm. to see happen. They care about small towns. And one of the people, Senator Brownsberger, who's a good colleague, um, you know, said that he, from his perspective, um, some of the concerns were not yet upon us because there was so much distance to walk between the law and the implementation. And that's why getting, you know, as Natalie said, one page mm -hmm. bulleted, sharp, um, 
clear, like this will happen, this will happen, just like you've said tonight, but something that we can deliver as soon as possible to Senate Ways and Means and House Ways and Means and the Speaker and the Senate President and, and the committees uh, in both uh, chambers that wrote that bill um, so that we can look at the bill again with these concerns and understand whether or not there are issues um, that can't be solved in the implementation, right? They still have to make all these rules yep. that the, the law tells them they have to make. Um, and so there's still things to do, which is why this kind of process and hearing from you at every level, at, at every stage um, is so important. Um, so we take this super seriously um, and, and really look forward to getting that from you as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you so much because it, it really it, it will be impactful and it and it will have a negative effect, at least on our community, I feel. Um, the next thing that we were thinking about, um, we did have some very positive meetings with the Department of Transportation, you know, Mass DOT um, down in Northampton about um, we would like to take over Sugarloaf um, Street and um, but of course we need everything brought up to to snuff and we don't want to take crumbling roads and crumbling um, sidewalks and infrastructure and stuff like that, sub, subpar drainage. You know, the um, water, stormwater is really a huge issue in Deerfield and, and they need to do some work on the infrastructure there. So our meetings we had, um, they encouraged us to support the transportation bond bill, which we did. And um, because they said they would put money into up for the upgrades so that we could take over the roads and you know, try to do some downtown work on our common because the, the old 116 comes up Sugarloaf and comes by the common and you're not allowed to do anything and it's all state land and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, this has been years of working towards this and we really aren't getting a lot more momentum and we'd really like to see this happen. Um, so, we were hoping that maybe a couple of phone calls would in continue to encourage the momentum of this. Um, Trevor, well, did you want to add anything? Yeah, to or just maybe a, a participation in a, in a meeting. You know, we, we did have a great meeting with, with District 2. Uh, it was just before COVID hit. And, uh, you know, I know that's put everything on the back burner. But um, there are a couple of issues that we have in town. Is I'm, I'm working on trying to kind of upgrade our common and make the path, pathway safe for people to walk on. And, and the, the sidewalks in town are atrocious. They really, really need to be invested in. And there are complete street programs that we, we want to tie all that in together. And I'm um, trying to work with some engineers to get a kind of a master plan of downtown kind of figured out so that when we do have these grant opportunities or money here and there that we are um, working in a unison uh, kind of a a master plan. So we just tackle each item as we can. The One of the biggest stumbling blocks is that most of the roads in town through you know through Sugarloaf onto Park Street and then hooking around and in front of Town Hall were the old 116 so they're owned by the state we have no access to do anything with them and yet nothing's happening from the state on them so we're like well we'll take them over but we you know and I know that the state would love to just say let's get rid of these things I don't want to own them anymore but but we need to work in partnership to have them upgrade the infrastructure so we would love to um facilitate that meeting again, have another sit down with them. And, and maybe um, if you wanted to be involved or, you know, at some point just kind of reach out so that we could kind of solidify a meeting to say, this is really important to Deerfield. We really want to get this moving. We want to be a partner with the state and help where we can um, to want to alleviate that long-term, you know, thing for them, but also to upgrade for our residents, th these areas. Um, and then we also, at the other end of town, we talked about this a while ago, and this is a little bit on, it was, 100% on Deerfield, really. There's the dry bridge, which we call that a dry bridge, but it's at the it's at the north end of Main Street, goes up over the railroad tracks. Um, that is failing. It, it really is in bad shape, and because it goes over the railroad, you know, it's it's a it's a big deal. Um, it was due to be fixed 20 something years ago, and. And, More uh, than 20 years ago, because I had nothing to do with it, Trevor. No, well, it was long before, but the leadership in town and their wisdom had 
for some reason or another, decided to pull the plug at the last minute. And um, we, uh, we said we would bake cookies. We will do anything we can to get that back on the list. So um, I think they're open to that, but it's just one of those things. If we're not talking, we're not in front of them, but we can't get any trucks coming. You know, if we have any trucks coming to Hardig or, uh, uh, excuse me, Pelican, um, or anywhere downtown, it, it's really hard to get through the center of town. It's not super safe and you can't get over the bridge and for, our, you know, a big fire equipment and stuff. It, it's just an issue that it really needs to be addressed and put back on the burner. So it's, it's the North end uh, bridge, the dry bridge, and then it's downtown. And uh, we really want to invest in Elm street. We really want to invest in Sugarloaf and park and our common. And um, we, we have plans to do the Leary lot. We call it. it's a big municipal parking lot so that we'd have more access and economic development. <laughs> And so all of that kind of thing is a large plan and but a big uh, hinge pin is is the state owning the, the land. So that's all that was uh, that. Uh, now that we're on the bridge subject to bridges, um, we did get the Stillwater Bridge back on the list. It's it's in pre design work. And it's so exciting because we own the bridge and the state is repairing it. So it's tens of tens of millions of dollars and it was like a decade of going to meetings and making sure that number was on the list. However, one of the things that we're really trying to um, include is the one-way traffic. So in other words, it's more, it makes it more expensive to, for um, the design is to work on one half of the side of the bridge and then you work on the other half of the side of the bridge. But um, to shut down Stillwater Bridge for three or more years is really, really awful. I mean, it will affect one of our, you know, it will affect farms that are on lower road and upper road, but it will also, it's bus traffic, it's ambulance service, it's police coverage, it's fire coverage. I mean, everything comes through, um, you know, Stillwater Bridge area. And um, so it's really important we have that a little extra expense in the scheme of things I mean, we're so thankful the state is is doing the repair work without issue. And we don't want to raise too much complaints about that because it's, I don't know how this happened. It was one of those things where you keep going to meetings and all of a sudden they say, okay, we don't want to see you anymore. And and so, or hear your complaints anymore. And so honestly, they, they, they're doing it. So I'm thrilled to death. So please, but on the other hand, if we could just get a little extra money for that one side and then the other side kind of traffic, so you always have one-way traffic, yep. instead of a complete shutdown, would be such a huge thing. So. Thank you for coming yeah. in tonight. Yeah, I know, I know. And, but so there's just a couple <laughs> more things that real quick, we were hoping from the congressional delegation um, point of view, if you can coordinate with our congressional delegation so that um, we can get more infrastructure money. I mean, we're just desperate to have money come to do. It's just not us with the sewer treatment plant. It's it's just just general stuff, bridges and culverts and you know everything. We just need some money for roads and and um, and and it's wonderful that you are talking about the Mass Works projects and there's additional money. But uh, you know, I can say there's three spots. On River Road, there are over a million dollars just on River Road. And, you know, you know, for us, this climate change, and we're getting now into climate change, the, you've got to make sure we get funding for the MVP program, more funding, because it was great when Deerfield was the first community certified and hardly anyone was doing, but now it is such a good program. It's so competitive and the grants have really shrunk. I mean, we, we were getting four or $500,000 at a time. And now they're like, oh, here's your, here, you can apply for, you know, we're thinking maybe 120 or 20. I mean, we need big money to deal with climate change. And because and, none of these culverts, none of these projects are cheap. And, and you want to do it right. Like the Leary lot that we're talking about, we want to do pervious pavers. And, you know, that's very expensive. Um, and but that's that's the best way to do it. It makes no sense to just pave things over anymore. You know we need to be smart, and but it costs money to be smart. So it would just be nice to have some infrastructure projects that would feel like we're moving along. 
and along along those lines, the mosquito district, um, people don't want spraying. You know, we don't want to spray. We would want to do the much safer route of lava siding, but lava siding is only effective as targeted. So, you know, doing the testing, doing the trapping is critical. And these little towns, and we're all, you know, there's, the mosquitoes don't know the borders. So these little towns cannot pay even our little, I mean, as a mosquito district, we'd charge hardly anything, but you know, it's, but it is a $5,000. And then if you want lava siding, it is above that. And that is not, this is a brand new line item expense for almost every single town because we're a brand new district. And especially the little towns, they can't pay. And, you know, we've, you know, we were very lucky to get several grants to get started from the state. And, and you all have been, ex have been super supportive, mm -hmm. but, so we have been able to do testing up like in trapping, like in Leiden and Coleraine and Heath, but you know, Heath can only, is only paying us thousand dollars. Greenfield is, I mean, uh, Berniston is only paying us $3,000 and our baseline expense is 5,000. And, and then you do, you know, you have other services and our additional traps and stuff like that. So if you could figure out a little line item for very small towns to participate, it would it would really make a huge difference. And we're not talking about a lot of money. It would probably be less than twenty five thousand or thirty thousand for the entire Pioneer Valley, you know, from Connecticut to to Vermont, and that so that would include the three counties. And um, I mean, it, it would make a huge difference. Great. Um, did we get everything that we had talked about? We could go on all night. Yeah, so. <laughs> but no, yeah, I think I think so. We just great. Did you have any follow up questions for us? Yeah. So I, I, the work that you're doing with MassDOT is really so excellent, and I, you know, I'm sure Natalie's thinking the same thing. Yes, let's get in with you and and be your best advocates. You know, Thank the you. best advocates we can be. So it feels like we need just a separate deeper dive here to understand both the bridge project and the road project um, okay. and really map out a strategy you know who's going to call who's going to yeah. request the meeting you know what documents we want to put together if we need one or two, you know that kind of stuff just to make sure that we're yeah. um, we're okay. doing that kind of follow-up and I'd love I, to I really thank you because it, it really we we had good momentum and then COVID hit and it nothing's really happened since and yeah you know, we're not getting return phone calls and stuff like that. So, yeah, but I'm it sure really, I don't think it's a fault. No, no, anyone. No, it's not. It's just everybody's scattered. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you're, I think you're right. I, I think COVID knocked us back on our heels. Yeah. Um, and now we have to figure out how to do COVID and everything else. And then at some point, God willing, um, yeah. we'll be able to see COVID in the rear view mirror, but we're not there yet. And so now it's, it is a balancing act where the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You know? Thank you. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, That's thank it. you so much for coming. And um, we'd love to invite you back. <laughs> we'd love to come back anytime. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know how to find us too. Yeah. So don't yeah. hesitate to call or email or text or, you know, whatever you need to, to be in touch with us uh, or to let us know what challenges okay. you're facing or ideas that you have. Thank you we so very much. Alongside you. Good. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your work. Thank you. Have a Thank great you Have all. a nice Take night. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Oh, planning board. I just want to say thank you very, very much for, um, you know, being willing to um, put this meeting off for another hour because we we really we hadn't had any chance to discuss anything, and it, it's really important to be productive with. Um, both Joe and Natalie, because they, they are effective if you whine enough. <laughs> so we want to do some really good whining tonight. Okay. You got, you got some good things. Yeah. Do you want to call your um, planning board to order, Annalie? Absolutely. Thank you. And everybody bear with me, because apparently I need to do this in the typical way. So I'm opening the meeting of the Deerfield Planning Board, Wednesday, February 10th, 2021 at 8 16 p.m. 
uh, meetings usually are at the municipal offices, but now they are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access um, in accordance with the governor's March 12, 2020 order. Um, and uh, meetings are typically, I see uh, FCAT is here, so our meeting will be <clears throat> broadcast by FCAT and remote meeting connections are on the agenda on DeerfieldMA.us. So um, roll call of members. Paul is not available. Max? No. Rachel? No. And Mary, I see your dog. Cloutier here, yes. Yes, there we go. Mary Cloutier, there we go. Uh, Denise? I'm here. And Annalise. So. I think Rachel may be a little late. I think she had said that originally in an email, maybe 10 minutes, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, actually, I got an email from Rachel. She's unable to attend. Oh, oh, so you don't have a quorum. We do oh. not. Oh, oh no. Uh, <laughs> Max. Anything um, from Max? About Max. Uh, not typical to hear from him between meetings. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we did some good preliminary work with council about how to go about the process for the election. Oh. We didn't talk about if there wasn't a quorum. Well, I would assume with something like this, we probably should have a quorum. Should you we? have to in order to finish the vote. I'm sort of thinking, can we have discussion without having You're a You're both quorum? posted, yes. but um, keep in mind, you have to have quorum to take the official vote to fill the vacancy. Right. So you, we're going to have to set up another meeting. And I'd kind of prefer that we have it, the discussion at the time when we're actually taking the vote. Okay. Oh, boy. Oh, man, I'm really sorry. Yeah, well, that's a bummer. I literally found out right after I sent the meeting link out. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, well uh, <clears throat> when is the next select board meeting? And we will do our best to have a quorum to attend. We meet about um, every night, just about. Well, every yeah. <laughs> we, we have, <laughs> yeah. Um, we the next time we will have a quorum um, is the twenty fifth. Twenty fifth. It's a Thursday though. It's not a Wednesday. Not a normal day. Because we That's have um, a water and sewer infrastructure meeting. How about you, Anne Mary? Are you going to be around? Are you kidding? I wouldn't miss it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be out of town that day. <laughs> yeah, let me check my busy schedule here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. This is pretty I'm not busy. We could do it the first, <laughs> first thing, you know, so that in and out and, uh, you know, we obviously. You want me to, to, I can open the agenda now. I just oh, renamed right, it. Yeah. Um, so I shouldn't. You want me to put this on as the first appearance and yes. say it can't be changed? Yes. If you yes. Talk, then, at six, yeah. Six yeah, o'clock, is it at six o'clock? Yes, six o'clock. Yes. Oh, six on the twenty-fifth. That 25th. might continue to be a problem for Rachel. Oh, right. It Rachel, is. Rachel, oh, Rachel, Rachel usually can only come later. It's yeah, seven, seven, seven o'clock. o'clock. It's fine. Seven, seven o'clock is fine. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Whatever's easiest for you, for sure. Yes, I forgot about that. I was just being thinking. Well, let's just do it right off so that um, nothing can interfere with it. But um, yeah. I forgot that. So thank you. Um, okay. So seven o'clock. On Thursday, the 25th. Yeah. Yep. And we'll sure. do our best to get the whole, put out all stops so that we can get everyone. Okay. So, um, Casey, will you make sure that you capitalize Thursday because it's a different day than we normally meet? Mm -hmm. So people know that it is it is the correct date. Well, thanks for hanging out for a little bit. Yeah, thanks for hanging Sorry about out. That. So then it, do I make a motion to close the meeting and have and set the date for the next meeting as um, February 25th at seven o'clock and we're going to co-meet with the select board? Look at that training. That was my motion. You're good. <laughs> you guys are doing great. A second <laughs> without a quorum. <laughs> well, for, oh, yeah. for, for discussion, okay? I'll just say that training was really excellent last night and um, I, yeah. I, I found it beneficial. Uh, I just, you know, I just could hear him talk for about four hours, so. Yeah, I'm hoping Adam will send us the documents, the, the two documents he said he would. 
Yes. Okay. He has, Jennifer will push him out tomorrow. Oh, excellent. Great. Okay, great. We got him this evening, so I haven't had a chance to do it. And okay. she's not working tonight, so uh, she'll do it as soon as she can tomorrow. Right. Ooh, Denise, no. even though we don't have um, a real official meeting here, do you want to second Anne Mary's? I will second that. In favor. <laughs> now I can go watch the impeachment. Oh. Yay, good luck. <laughs> Pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you. Oh, yeah. wait, you guys got to vote. You got to oh. do a roll call vote. You yeah, seconded okay. it, but they need oh. to roll, roll call yeah, out. Right. Uh, and Mary. Aye. Uh, Denise? Yes. And Lee, yes. Uh, the meeting is closed. All right. All right. Thank, hey, you. thank you, guys. It's Bye. really nice seeing you. Good yeah. to see you, too. See you on the 25th. All right. Yeah. All right. right. Bye-bye. Um, next item on the agenda is the sewer commissioner's um, yes. policies. I hadn't had a chance with I, Oh, Trevor, thank you for saying that. I was so felt so guilty. No, I, I know. I'm so sorry. I haven't had a chance to read them. We have been like up to our ears in vaccine. Literally. Literally. And uh, so every waking moment and meeting has been about that. And uh, I haven't had this, but I noticed that you did put a couple examples of uh, stuff in our packet. So I plan to read that tonight. Um, and I would like to... to Send a shout out to Alex, who's mo who's moderating the meeting tonight, because he he found all of them, well, and I went through them and started pulling the ones that weren't good job. Yeah, um, pulling the ones that were because what you see is really geared toward wastewater, but Alex found a bunch that were both wastewater and, and water, because most of the time those two disciplines run together. Right. So okay. I wanted you to have a chance to look at them. There's a couple of longer documents yep. that Alex found that I can push out individually, but they were really long and, and sort of hard to parse unless you were focusing on them one yeah. at a time. We'll dig into these and then reach out if we need anything further. That's awesome. Very good. Thank you, Alex, on that. Um, Thanks, Alex. Uh, you're yeah, welcome. Thank you, because I, I'm, I'm yep. embarrassed to say I just didn't have, I literally did not have a chance to read them. So literally, we're up to our elbows in COVID vaccine and managing all of this. And it's really Carolyn. So we're just, the rest of us are kind of just doing well, no, the support work we need to do. Everybody's working. It's just, it's, it's just overwhelming it at the moment. I didn't read it because I was babysitting for my grandson. Hey, that's, that's <laughs> even better. Hey, that's probably the more legitimate excuse. Yeah. <laughs> um, Anyway, okay, so we'll, we'll put that off for a little while. Um, until, can you put that on the agenda for the next meeting? Yeah, and I will. I will. And I promise I'll read it. Um, how do you want us, to, do you wanna wait for the whole discussion to happen on the 25th or do you want us to um, pull out um, different parts of different cities policies that we like and um, like, cut and paste or how do you want us to handle this because cutting and what might be useful do. cutting and pasting what might be do. useful is what you just said kind of highlight the things that you think would be and you could you could reference it okay this town paragraph one or two or whatever yep. and if you can right. just itemize it for me then we can circle back around into how to pull it together so that it's a more meaningful document yep. it's just with zoom it's kind of hard to parse through each yep. sentence yeah so, um, yes, and I, I mean, I already know I can see a couple things in a couple different communities that I like, and I, I mean, there isn't one that I want to use as the basis yet. I mean, I haven't read them close enough. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I just glanced at them I'm like, oh, I don't already don't like that one. So, um, so I got to read through them and see if there's one that's good enough to be the basis of how we want to cut and paste. We might have to get a couple okay. more cities. I'll look at this and then we, and, Tre and Trevor and Dave, if you can look at this, if yeah. none of these cities are the ones that you want to use for the basis, maybe we can keep hunting because yeah. you need, you need the template. Yeah. And then you just you build on it. either cross out or add the things from the other communities you like. Yeah. Kind now of putting the template together can be a formatting thing. Yeah. The, the thing that's important is for you guys to parse through the, the important decision-making elements of setting up abatements. Okay. Yep. And in some of these communities, it's very complex. I mean, Alex even found one from Boston. Some are very complex. Some yep. are much more streamlined. Yep. 
Yeah. So, well, that's what I was just going to say. It's, it's no different than the public health thing. You remember I wanted the um, microblading from Boston in, in our, yes. in our uh, tattoo things, because certain ones have certain sections that are really good. Yeah. And, um, okay. But I'm not sure I want to have the Boston one be the basis of our Deerfield sewer no, no, no. And that's, it's also a longer one. And because it's more complex and involves water, I, I sort of didn't focus on that one. I tried oh. to pull together some of the ones that were just wastewater. Yeah. yeah. Community Thank you. Because I already know that I don't want the Boston one. Yeah. So. No, okay. I get it. All right. Thank you. Um, All right. So I added that. Um, I added that to the 25th. I've also okay. added seven o'clock and I've bolded the item in an appearance for the planning board to discuss um, the vacancy. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Casey. Um, did, I didn't see in the packet that there was any resignations, appointments or hires, was there? We didn't. I had left that as sort of a, a, okay. a hold item yeah. um, Good, in case I, I received something. Upright. I don't see anything. All right. Um, but what you would be, you know, would be really good is if maybe Trevor could read the three, those three committees are the committees that are sort of right in our faces right now because we've had resignations yeah. or we've had conversation about them. The so those three committees, maybe Trevor, you could read that and that we could just sort of. The Conservation Commission, the Senior Housing Committee, Open Space and Recreation Committee were the three that we right. were. Yeah. We're looking for members right now uh, for those three committees, and their um, conservation commission meet, uh, uh, is very important. Mm -hmm. Senior housing, we're trying to really get that going. We're determined to make sure we get really senior housing here. And the open space and recreation committee, of course, is important because we're trying to work on our town park. So it would be really important. These are actually important committees right now. So thank you very much. Um, Casey, can you give us the uh, town administrator update? So right now, oh, sorry, I'm going to move from one, one document to the other. Um, so right now, as you've mentioned before, our real focus has been on COVID response, particularly around vaccination. And we're trying to do the best we can to support everyone in the background. And I've had some meetings with Jeff and Brian in Sunderland and Waitley respectively so that we can narrow down what things look like on the website so people can help. I know there's some communication issues that people are running into because there's a lot of people trying to handle a lot of information all at once. So I just ask people to bear with us because we're doing the best we can in the circumstances we have. And you've got you and Carol and Trevor sort of managing the 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 plan the getting the vaccine the, the setup all of these things are in the background and a lot of people don't realize how much work that takes so yeah. you guys are doing all that work and we're just and trying to make sure that the information that goes out yes. is what you want us to say no i know it's um, a lot. but that's been a big push yep yep I think um we we've had there was actually a meeting this morning about kelleher drive culvert and we have a new schedule being pushed out but before we push that out to you all, um, our engineer, Zach Cherniak, wants to have a quick meeting. Okay. So I'll have more information on that once I have something to say. Um, one thing that David and Carolyn may not know is we had the, Trevor mentioned it earlier, we had the update meeting with DPC and Jennifer Shero um, from USDA yesterday. Yeah. And I was instructed to request from Jennifer uh, relief from <coughs> the requirement of all the LOC documents because we've done some of them, but there's still some that we're waiting for. I was asked to request relief to, con to go continue the design process into the bidding process so we can stay on schedule for the up upgrades. So I'm in the middle of drafting that letter to Jennifer, or that email to Jennifer so that I can do that. In the background, um, Barbara's working with Jennifer Shero uh, on along the lines of what our bond documents need to be 
there's some more information that Jennifer was going to give to me about documents that I need to provide for her. Mm -hmm. So there'll be some signature requests and generally just pulling it all together because it's been a slog yeah. and it's not an easy, the, the list of documents is not easy to discern. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's been a lot of give and take to figure out what needs to happen. And Casey's been, you know, we've had transition in our administration. They've also had transition in their administration and everything kind right. of just went poof. So Casey's been working so hard with everybody trying to pull it all back together and say, do we have everything so we can go out to bid? And I think we're going to be in good shape. I know that Jennifer's going to work with us on, on language to be able to allow us to go out to bid on the 16th. I think most of this stuff is just kind of understanding truly what they want and um, you know right. well they want you know rates and stuff and we're like well we got to go out to bid for that but they're looking for um what they had promised us a year and a half ago to be kind of written into a template and they know it's going to change when we go out to bid for you know the the financing and the payments and the schedule and all that stuff so we just didn't really the thing about that is it does confirm what we agreed to yes in preparation for the bid the construction and eventually the bond right so i've been also working with brenda and barbara so that we can sort of wrap our heads around some of the things that we weren't sure about so at the meeting on friday brenda and barbara have been invited so that they get a better idea of schedule because it definitely affects the financials of it and i brenda had mentioned it to me and we reached out to trevor to sort of figure that part out Yep. Um, and when Trevor stopped by to pick his packet up, we talked about it. So they'll be going, I have a doctor's appointment, so I may not make it for the, for the beginning of that meeting. Mm -hmm. um, Casey, I, um, I, I'm really, my big concern is that I just want us to make sure that we're focused on the ability to do as much engineering as possible um, and keep that out front because I'm, I'm sure that we're going to be doing there will be an infrastructure bill of some sort. And I'm sure we'll be eligible for some funding, but it ha will have to be shovel ready. And so we wanna be able to um, take whatever part of the project or the end of the project or you know, any part of it to um, get funding from you know, some kind of infrastructure bill. So um, it's important, we missed out you you remember we missed out in 2008 because we had no shovel ready projects when there was an infrastructure project that came out to get the economy going and i yes, believe uh, no you know we were promised an infrastructure um bill for four years and there was no um it was winding up of i think it was Oh, it was back in 2012 was the last infrastructure bill. So I'm, I'm telling you, there's a huge pent up demand and there will be money that will be allocated. You know, you never know how much money you're going to get, but it will be allocated geographically. So Massachusetts will get a share of the money and we need to be ready to grab our share of the Massachusetts money. Mm -hmm. And part of that is having the engineering done for what we want to do. So that we can get the money to do it. Well, they are going to. They are working on. You know, a lot of phase two is is drawn already. So it'll be it'll be right. pretty close to. Yeah, pretty I mean, but even if it costs us a little bit more money earlier, I still it's think it's important. really important to keep focused on that engineering, getting the design yep. enough ready that you can tweak it and get it out the door in yep. two or three weeks. And, and that's really. I mean, I feel like there's so much pent up to need cross country that we we will hear about the infrastructure bill and if we can get it out in a you know within three to four weeks um or two to three weeks then we'll have a really good chance of getting that money so yeah, trevor yeah. that's a task i'm going to need help with because a lot of this connectivity between yeah. dpc and the town goes through you yeah no i'll do um, and in all that yep. uh, trevor, um, trevor and in knows, fact I there mean, may be some opportunity yeah I was thinking about this and I thought I mentioned it, but there may be some opportunity in the community one stop for growth. Yes. The problem is, is we don't have a huge amount of time. And so I was going to bring this up. So community one stop for growth, I think would have, we could have some opportunity there to deal with Leary. 
yep. because of shared spaces and stuff. And it was something that Trevor said to me and I looked at it and went, yeah, that makes sense. So I think maybe, I think maybe we should brainstorm and see if we can figure that out because community one stop for growth can allow us to plug into other mm -hmm. connected grants and, Man. but, and pull it all together. And so mm -hmm. maybe it's a good launching pad to then pull other pieces of this pie together, like complete streets, because you mentioned it a, a few weeks ago, we need to start pulling the pieces together. So that we've got a rounded project mm -hmm. that like Carolyn says is shovel ready. Right. Right. So well, the that's reason, kind the of other, in my thought. Well, yep. the other reason I, I brought this up is because last week, you know, was the national association of conservation district meetings all week. Mm -hmm. And, um, so they're starting to put the committees together to work on the next farm bill, which is in 2023. Um, so mm -hmm. usually, you know, that's, it, it gets done that year. It's, you know, instituted that year. So, um, so we're working on it right now. And I volunteered for the committee that, you know, the USDA committee that um, uh, covers rural development and infrastructure. So nice. my big, I, already, I made the comment to everyone um, and all 50, believe me, all 50 states were there. It was, on, I mean, with the Zoom technology, we had um, a couple hundred people there um, from all 50 states plus the territory. So it was pretty exciting. But um, anyway, I, so I'm on, I'm, I'm potentially gonna be appointed to the committee. And I brought up the point that, you know, there has been no infrastructure, all these, um, it was through this funding of EPA and the, and the infrastructures for cleaning up the river. And the big focus is still on water quality now. And the EPA person, Kyra Jacobs was there. And I, I spoke to her offline a little bit and she, she feels very strongly that we're, we're gonna be seeing money for this kind of stuff coming and, mm -hmm. um, and to be ready. And, and so we're, I'm gonna make sure we yeah. try to get fund, more funding for the um, USCA projects yeah. and, 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 and rural development. And, and I'm hoping in this next new farm bill. So the money will be made, made available in 2023. And, and so when you think about it, this is not very far away. No. So no, it's not. Uh, if we, again, if, if nothing happens between now and 2023, we're gonna have more opportunities, I think in 2023, where they're gonna give us more money and the match is going to be less because that's what I said. The match is overwhelming and you can't, you know, we, we've got to have more um, percentage coverage and, and lower interest rates and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at 2023 that we've got to be smarter and better and um, be ready for that. And, but I, I also think there is still going to be an infrastructure bill sooner. I mean, yeah. I mean, just a regular one. So and then we, you know, we do have to also think about, um, I mean, in all of this, I think we need to recognize through finance committee, through our board, that, um, that there is a, a capacity ability for us to tackle yeah. all this stuff. And I think it may be yeah. worth, you know, looking into funding um, a grant um, facilitator or something like that that would be able to the, the amount you know we there's all these great programs and everyone says oh look at Sunderland they took advantage of that well they might be doing one item or a, a couple of different things is that you don't have the capacity to run your town and also be grabbing all this grant money because you now have to implement and write all the grants and report all the grants and it's a ton of work for accounting and all that stuff and I think it's I think it's just important that we um, support our staff to be able, you know, so if they're, if, because you spend a little bit of money, you get a bunch of money. So it's, it's, a, but it's you all do about spend money on the back end yeah. where you're monitoring your spending, you're coordinating with the accountant and the treasurer, you're, yeah. you're reporting and we've been lucky, but a lot of these grants, like I have a grant report that has, that's due next Wednesday that I've done the grant itself. Like I've been, I'm familiar with it. It's the grant reporting piece. And I don't have very many people to ask for help because it's, it's not one that a lot of my peers have done. Yeah. So I have to dig into it and that just takes time. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, but the also, capacity building there is kind of a focus thing too. We don't want to miss it. Yeah. 
And also, right. I mean, and this is the one that helps us with our hazard mitigation. Yeah. yeah, and we're not eligible some some of the grants too. Right. I mean, but you uh, don't know until you try. Like we want to try everywhere, and I think it's and I think it's important that we support. You know, it may, we may have to look at helping support that a little bit so that we can access more of these grants. Yeah. Especially the ones that are in this community one stop for growth because yeah. they're think. collaborative, they're collaborative, but they've created this need to really tell people what you want to do, even if you don't have the engineering done. You right. write down basically a position statement and yeah. say, This is what we want to do. These are the elements that are in play. Can you help us do that? Which is what they designed it to do. That's you fantastic. send the expression of interest in and they come back and say, okay, this is what you need. But for me to stop working on everything else and, and pivot for that, it's just not possible in the office. Yeah. So that's, I, I'm interested. On the other hand, I know what it means in terms of time constraints, mm -hmm. particularly with the budget. And so this was my other thought. I don't know, David, what, you weren't there, so I'll give you a brief background. Monday, we had a capital improvement, a joint capital improvement select board finance committee meeting. It was I the wasn't most there either, amazing. <laughs> hey, you were there, you were there. Yeah, I was there, but. Oh, right. <laughs> my internet was so bad. Her internet was spotty, let's yeah. put it that way. Right. Um, but it was the most amazing brainstorming session that I've seen in a long time. And I wanted to tell the board, first of all, we got through a lot of information, just touching on basic information. Second, I watched you guys solve a problem that I've been struggling with for months. And that was dealing with the Oxford property mm -hmm. because I threw out the issue and I've mentioned it, but I threw it out to what, 16 people? Yeah. And six of you, they, so what happened, David, was I throw out the issue with the Oxford property. The biggest issue is you have to put a number in the RFP. You have to decide what is your lowest number you will take. But usually you base that on either the assessed value or an appraisal. And it's anecdotally been said to me, economically things, yeah. values of property have dropped. And so the thing that comes up for me is, do we want to hold, and I didn't ask the question, I watched everybody else ask the question. Do we want to hold on selling the property and watch property values come back up? Or yeah. do we want to offload it and take a loss on what we spent on it? Yeah. And so I literally, I know, I know Carolyn, but I watched you guys solve that problem. And so my comment to you, and I plan to write this down when I can, put my blinders up and like <laughs> not and my headphones in i think we need to do the rest of that budget process in so far as we can together because yeah, you guys solved sense. a problem so quickly and so effectively and i think if we could parse through more portions of that budget yeah even if it's just starting in capital i right. think if we could do that understanding the ramifications of each section of this budget is going to make it a heck of a lot easier because yeah. I think we're really going to be surprised with what comes through from the school yeah. because the cost for COVID are just exponential over there. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I think there's, there's a, there's a good way to do this. And it was funny, you know, I watched Trevor really facilitate allowing everybody to talk and going through the list and all that stuff, you know, sort of taking everybody's input in and, you had the documents in front of you. Not everybody saw my email on Friday mm -hmm. and knew that their documents were out in the foyer. Right. So I connected with Jeff after the meeting. I sent him some information because he had asked about documents that he hadn't seen or that yeah. it got lost in the shuffle. So I sent him the budget document, the capital document, and I reminded him that his budget information was out in the foyer. Um, there's some technology issues there. But by and large, I think we could make much faster progress if we did it together. Yeah. Now, I know there's always been a lot of resistance to that because I've worked in Deerfield, maybe not for this past year, but I've worked in Deerfield a long time and I know how it works. 
But I think you've got an opportunity here to move in that direction. And this is the perfect time to do it because we're struggling. Yeah. Every different funding area is struggling. You've got the struggle of balancing capital with omnibus because services need to continue. The right. struggle with the three largest cost factors in our municipal budget, which is police, um, DPW, and education. Yeah. Those are the three biggest factors. Mm -hmm. And so how do we manage all this information and get to a good point in time for June effectively where everybody has the ability to understand it all at the same time? Right. You know, it may not be that we parse it and really evaluate it in our brains long term. But if you can be part of the initial conversation, it's a lot easier to watch it play out and participate in how those decisions are made. Mm -hmm. So are, that's are my you pitch. Suggesting, are you suggesting that we have joint uh, finance and select board meetings on Tuesdays? Yep. Okay. I'm suggesting it. I don't know. I, that's going to go over like a ton, a lead brick, I think. Well, if they're open. But I watched you guys solve a problem that's really been looming, and I watched you do it very quickly. It well, I think, you know, uh, most of us, I mean, we, we show up. I mean, I don't show up for you every do. single one, but I think we show up, you know, off and on, or we trade off or whatever. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, I don't think it's a bad idea. And if, if it, Dave doesn't feel bad about not, I mean, because I don't know what his schedule is on, on the Tuesdays, but what was the second well, and the fourth or I, was the first and the third what i would recommend maybe is um having one more joint meeting like we had like like we had because now that they've absorbed the information everybody's looked at those capital things um we have one more meeting where we kind of go through and facilitate that all together you know kind of move the things off that we know we can't do this year or just have a more in-depth conversation about the capital so that they would feel more comfortable that okay the select board is leaning towards these priorities for that we don't have to go through 19 of them at the moment or 20 of them we can really zero in on these the, the, the you know and i know the finance committee likes to do those individual you know departments and bring you know have those individual meetings which is fine right. we're not looking to take over any of that um the, the only thing i thought was if because we i need their help to kind of understand a bit too so if we do it together and hammer through the capital part and then talk about some of those other bigger items and then kind of and then we'll sit in whenever they want on the, on the individual department stuff um and, and answer for our budgets as well but i think the bigger ticket is the, those capitals and the bigger projects and i think slogging through the capital is the biggest that 22 million dollar yeah total at the bottom really took every caught everybody and knocked them for six yeah. and so parsing through it is very important but understanding the ramifications of what you're not funding yeah. in the context later of what the omnibus budget is is also important yeah and so uh, i think what happens is if if people's information subset is siloed it's harder for them to understand how capital connects to the omnibus budget Mm -hmm. If they don't see a ramification, for instance, of what not having a website that is effective does. Mm -hmm. It costs me two hours of time yesterday right. because I can't change, my, change the website to do a certain thing. You know, and there was another hour because we aren't able to push information out a certain way on the website because it isn't organized the right way. And so we do need to change the platform but here's the cost in time. Right. And so capital doesn't always see that, that pr perspective because they're looking at the dollar figure for a project. Yeah, or for and it. They also don't Whereas, get the phone calls, yeah. complaints. <laughs> that's true. Exactly. And there that's is fine. That's, time. that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. But and when I make a pitch for a $50,000 website, complaints. there's a reason. Right. Yeah. I mean, we get complaints about the website all the time. And right. I complain to you about it, and but people call you. I complained to Trevor know. about it today. <laughs> yeah, but you, you and you and um, um, Jen get complaints. You know, you have to spend time, time all the time. You know about our website. 
I, I mean, that was so taking an in-depth view of that and not just looking at the dollar figure that's in the capital expenditure. The only list. thing I, is it truly that expensive to, to have someone reorganize it? Well, part of it is, so first of all, it's a scalable expense. So the bigger town you are, the more it's going to cost because you're transferring more documents. That's the biggest problem is transferring documents, which effectively means not just a piece of paper, but also a page of information. And so, so there's a correlation. That? Who moves that? Your, your person that, that you're hiring? Normally, it's the platform that you're working with. You take the old website and you take all those pages and you take all the information on those pages and you shift them. But what you do in the background is you organize what it's supposed to look like. So you know well, what the new platform say, should look like. Do you have, you have a, someone that's experienced enough to know what those documents are? I mean, you know. Yes, and I, I can get us technical assistance for it. And in fact, that's okay. built into what the budget request was. Okay. Um, because we right. need the technical assistance to actually organize it. Right. I was and just so this say, is kind of what Lily's talking about. Yes. Is right. Where because, are you placing things? Because it's not going to be fixed if you just transfer the stuff because yeah, it's exactly. organized incorrectly. You cannot find anything. It's not right. intuitive at all. And um, mm -hmm. you just have to keep. Yeah. I we, mean, it stuff is there, but it's not available. Exactly. And so I've seen this work well. And I've seen this that we're living with now. And so, you know, this is one of those items that I'm asking the board to support me on because this has a direct effect on my ability to do my job. And yeah. for anybody else that gets these same requests, because there's at least five of us that get them all the time. Yeah. So could, could I just uh, circle back and say, um, you know, just reach out to the chairs of the you know, or everybody that was at the meeting the other night and ask if they have an appetite for, for another one of those to just more in depth and see what they say, if they're interested. And then whatever night they're planning, I'm happy to attend and we could just try to- That you know, would be- Do that a little bit more. I them. think they would hear it differently coming from you, Trevor, than they will from me. Oh, okay. Uh, based on past experience. All right. Um, but the reason I'm asking is, is simply, and this is what I want to write down, is simply I watched you all solve a problem in less than 10 minutes that made a huge impact on how things move forward. Are, are you saying this because I couldn't get on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you said exactly what needed to be said, Carolyn. Yeah. You know, we need to put off oh, selling the property. Yeah. Because right now there just isn't an appetite in the market for a value, a, a property value that we need. And, and yeah. yeah, mothers agreed with that. I know. And, skip and, and, and no, you I, know, I heard Jeff speak to it. I heard Skip Olmstead speak to it. Yeah. You spoke to it, Carolyn. It seemed like everybody understood the fact that it was maybe a time to sort of hold and watch what happened. Yeah, roll it over. Um, the the other thing was, was the reaction to the capital project plan. So my idea with that was, and I had talked to Brenda and I had seen this and the idea was throw out there what you guys have asked me about or that have come up in conversations See, so that they have a bigger picture of what's looming. Right. But I also you just want to straight, straight reds. I'm yeah. not trying to interrupt you, but um, I know the complaint was there was 19 requests, but again, we have been working over and over and over again to get people to put in for whatever they think is they need. And then it doesn't mean we're going to fund it. It doesn't right. mean we're going to do it this year or next year or, or whatever. But the problem is it still bothers me. There's plenty more and Trevor and Dave both know this. There's plenty more that have, is out there. It is not in, has not come in. So right. it's the right. not come in that is bothering me more than, oh, there was 19 requests. Well, yeah. guess what? There should be probably 49 requests. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's really the comment. Mm -hmm. yes. it's, we're trying to give them a more robust picture instead of narrowing it down so much that you can't see outside the blinders you put on your eyes. What, what we're trying to change is the mentality from what are we going to be able to afford this and what year. is a crisis versus right. true long-term preventative planning. maintenance and planning. 
Yeah. And this drives me And crazy. so that's really what I was trying to do. It's not perfect by any means. But I thought it was much more robust than it had been. And I didn't do it in a box. I really looked back at what you guys had talked to me about. I had notes. I had drafted some of this stuff and sort of sat back and waited. We had some changes in the amount um, based on updated information that came through. For instance, the senior needs and feasibility, that changed in less than a week because of, you know, just sitting so down and crunching again, numbers better. I, again, I just want to make sure that you convey to the department heads because I felt like it was a pretty negative converse, conversation on the number of requests. It needs to be still more requests and more big picture well, because there's still, I am still concerned about all the stuff that is not showing up. And I know it's out there and Dave and, right. and Trevor both know, as well as you know, that we get, we know there's more stuff out there. And I mean, just the, the building's falling apart. Yeah. There was no, not really anything really, I mean, yes, we're addressing the police station issue because that is actually a health issue at the moment or, you know, going to be a health issue. For critical response, still, yes. But there are stuff about the roofs. There's, you know, there's just regular yeah. maintenance that's not even showing up, and it's, so it still bothers me that we're. And so that's why you saw another, that big price tag. At least, right, we're missing at least double of what we're seeing, and and we got. And get so people. what we do is we start. We I don't know. just start with a hundred things. No. We start. We did it with nineteen, and they lost, they went. Ah! I know. Okay. The point is, is we started. I think they and so having the GRLA information was really useful because it made it easier for me to make the case of, hey, you know, we've got basic maintenance items like $10,000 for the back steps and the ramp on the assessor side mm -hmm. that we need to do. And so I, I had received something from Karen, but I really just, I referenced it. I said, hey, look, this is something that's relatively cheap, but it also fits our ADA plan. Right. Because we got to keep up with that. Even if it's little bits and bits here and there, we still do that. So the point is, is I, it's by no means perfect, but I think it was more robust than it was, than it had been. And the reason was, is I listened to you guys say, we need to get this out there. So they have a be better picture. So, do you, do so you that's what I'm, the reason I'm saying, you know, the picture isn't just capital over here or the omnibus budget here. It's all these things playing together mm -hmm. and that's i just there's a good opportunity here if we can How use do we it. want to uh, move forward then do you, do you want me to ask or do you want to write a letter asking from me or uh, just to um people like you did last i time? think i'd just like to mention to everybody and i could do it in a, in a memo just yeah. acknowledge to everybody how useful i think that meeting was even mm -hmm. though the fear factor was huge i think everybody the, the meeting itself was very useful because everybody got to listen to other people's opinions that they don't necessarily see. Yeah. And so that's a great oh, Hey, Casey, you know, that's, that's interesting. Maybe we could do this and we do it sort of a sideways in a sideways approach rather than a head on mm -hmm. something that they may react to. And I'm trying to be strategic here and yeah. they're going to watch this meeting and wonder why I'm saying this, but it's a strategic change in how we approach things. I think they would appreciate us all kind of being together. I mean, I'm not here to step on any toes for sure. I, I just want to help guide them as to what we think is really important and listen to them on what they think is important. And let's kind of figure out a way to make it happen. And one thing I noticed is in the past, and it was last budget season, I noticed that they questioned you know, once, once they finish a document and it goes to the select board, there seemed to be this question about whether the select board really understand, understood why they made a decision. Well, if the select board's in the meeting with you, then yeah. everybody has a chance to... We keep we have to set up meetings that everybody can go to? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Hey, your internet is as bad as mine is yeah. the other I day. Think we better adjourn before we all kind of shut down. <laughs> okay. I see that, Dave. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. We're all drifting here. It's yeah. late. Yeah. Can you hear me? So yes, we can. So can you um, can you send a memo or something? So let me. Yes, I will do that. There's one other thing. Can I ask the board, please? Yes. 
to allow me to set a deadline to receive documents of not less than 48 hours prior to a meeting because exactly what happened with the energy resources newsletter, it has happened several times and it makes it hard for me to push the information out to you guys because a lot of times you need to see it on paper. And so if I set it up and say from now on, we do, if you don't get it to me by Monday at four o'clock, it's not getting on there. Um, because if we're printing and I hold off as long as I can, yeah, if we're way. printing yeah. Wednesday morning, we really don't have a lot of wiggle room there. I'm, I'm fine with that. Go, Anna Lee. She's saying That's a thumbs up. Yeah. Board, absolutely. Board, right? Yeah. And it's something that you could do as well, Annalie. You could just create, you know, for me, I'm asking the board to sort of create a policy. Mm -hmm. I will verbalize the policy, um, but really understand that it does have a huge impact in how we respond from a support perspective. It's an efficiency thing and it's just correct. Thing. So that's fine. I'm okay with that. It's, I mean, but just yeah. if you're going to put a memo. How about 72 hours instead of 48? We could do it that way too. I mean, yeah. I, um, Annalie, it, just, it gives a little can, bit more We time. can push it up, but you got to start somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I was thinking. 48 hours is the time period for posting. I'm yeah, willing to start sense. there. That makes sense. It yeah. does. Do, do you have any thoughts on that, David? Well, it, the longer we can have to be able to view documents before the meeting, the better off. I know. Yeah. And part of that's my you know, fault. Some of this stuff, you know, <laughs> you know, we don't see it until just before the meeting and it's hard for us to make a judgment on it. Yeah. Yep. So but, sometimes you'll see me send emails out that are, that are specific to one topic. Yeah. It's because I want to give you a little more time. But one of the issues, and this goes right back to capacity, like Trevor mentioned, one of the issues is, is it's really hard to put the packet together and give you enough time when I'm, when it's constantly changing. Yeah. And so I have well, not done a good job yeah. of that. And I want to acknowledge that publicly. I'm trying to do better, but it's, it's really difficult with the amount of stuff coming in. None so of us I'm working on it. Yeah. This might help. Yep. Well, it would be really helpful to have you know the packet at least a day ahead of time too because i would like to be able to give it to you when we publish when we yeah. post that meeting that was always where i was comfortable i know i know we've tried in the past casey yeah. i know we tried in the past and i know it can't happen all the time but i i have to say when i when i pick up the packet you know with the zoom stuff you know i always came in early to look at the things but there, right. you just can't possibly read it, all the stuff in an afternoon and if and when you get phone calls constantly or stuff's happening you can't i mean i just i used you to need at least an hour you to could block out that. you know two or three hours and you could look and you had a chance to go through your packet and read everything but you know i don't have then maybe we do need to make it 72 hours because if i know no, what's not realistic coming in you're, you're going to have people always Let's, if we could do the 48 oh, hours and then then you could give it to us, you know, a day in advance, that would be a huge difference. Yeah, that'll be fine. And we know okay. things will change and every once in a while you'll have to stick something in unanticipated. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're okay with that, but everybody makes the effort. It'll be more efficient for them and for us than for you. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's right. not fair if, if Dave, I mean, Dave swings by all the time, you could pick stuff up and, but if, we just don't have where everyone is so busy. You don't have the solid block of time to focus. And I know, and if, you know, I just don't have a clean afternoon anymore that you can just look at your documents before a meeting. Right. So um, it would be really helpful to have a whole day that, you know, I got an hour here or half an hour here. You know, you can do it in sections instead of all at once. Right. And then sometimes it's a lot of documentation. I mean, I've sent you, 200 page packets before because there's just so many documents. I know. So, and, okay, and, we'll go or with it's that. complicated, like, like okay. looking at the sewer abatement policies, you know, the, you have to think about it. And right. Easier for me and to And there's gonna be conversation stuff. around that yeah. stuff. Yeah. So right. the yeah. other thing I need to tell you and then I will shut my mouth is tomorrow is my one year anniversary. No, don't clap concerned. because <laughs> don't clap. <laughs> not where you give her your, your resignation. Right? No, 
It's where I remind everybody that we need to do a personnel evaluation. I know, more work. I know, right? Exactly, that's what I yeah. said. Nobody and I, so, I, I still, the town report is hanging over my head. When is that? Are you writing that this year? Oh my God, I have. You should ask you Trevor for help. I did it. I've done it. I can do it with you if you want, or, you know. Well, well we're going to have to do something. Yeah, we could get together and knock it out, I think. I think. Uh, oh, that not that due? Wait, wait a second. The, if the, the town meeting, meeting is put up, push off, can't we, we got push a off? Time. So we talked about that in the office, actually. <laughs> we talked about that. Yeah. Don't um, I get an extra couple weeks? We <laughs> probably should have it ready, at least for the election, which hasn't changed. Yeah. Oh. Because Oh, that's that's okay. That's an extra. What is that? An extra week or two, maybe. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. You know what yeah. would be great, having done this myself, Trevor, yeah. if there were a couple of things that you could just like jot down and and shoot to me, I will share them with Carolyn. Okay. Yeah. I usually what, what I do is I pull out my binders and I go meeting by meeting and month by month, and that's how I do the report. And that way you go, okay, we did this. This is you know. And you then what you and then then what I did is I I went over and and made it yep. you know connected it more. Yes, exactly. So, she flushed it out for me, so it was. So good. why don't we do a reorganizational thing? Even though Carolyn's the chair, if it would be helpful and Trevor could devote some time to it, which he doesn't have, but I know he would do it. Yeah. If he could do the outline and you could fill in the blanks, wouldn't that make it worse, more easy? Yes. If I had a template, because and I have to say, having Trevor do hold all his meeting minutes in hard copy has, has been worked out perfect because you can, you start flipping through it and you forget. I mean, yeah, yeah, when you go to rewrite, when you go to write this stuff, you forget because it's a year, it's January to January. It's not right. fiscal year. Exactly. So you're halfway through your minutes. You go back from the prior fiscal year and, and it really actually is very effective to do it that way. If you don't mind, and then you give me the rough draft. Yeah, you I you know, just parcel out stuff. You work on something on one meeting and it takes you multiple meetings or months to go through a project. So you talk right. to her, like you could talk about that the whole year, but, but you know, you kind of just broke it into like the most important things. And you know, municipal every, aggregation is a perfect example of that. Exactly. Yep. We started it so. one month. We worked on it. I talked about it again here tonight. So yeah, no, yeah. I, I could help you with an outline for sure. Oh, that would be wonderful, See? Trevor. Problem solving. And also the section when you do the do the sewer, if you could flesh yeah. that out a little bit. Yeah, of course. Yep. I could flesh out some of the other things. Yep. And and then Dave, we'll let run it by Dave. Yeah. See what yeah. He thinks. And we could put that on an agenda if you want. You guys can all talk about it because again, I don't want to violate open meeting law, but no. I know Trevor has a good place to start, and I know Carolyn can flesh through some of those details. Well, the other thing, um, but if it comes through me, I'll look through it and then I can just say, hey, look, I don't understand how to do this. You know? The other thing I wouldn't mind too is, you know, we have, we've always kind of wanted to do kind of a little weekend retreat kind of thing. Well, usually when yeah. we were in Boston, we, we would get together and talk about some of the- That's what we used to do. And we could, we could hit something uh, like on a weekend or something like that where everybody's busy doing other stuff, but- you could take a take an hour or two and just hit there is a way to do that we could yeah. set up we could set that up so that we have a little time just to hash through things yeah um we do have to there's a way to do it i'd have to go back and read through that yeah, but there is a way to do it and we can hash through some of the things that are really kind of looming out there yeah just to um stuff that not everybody wants well to i i think it would be really nice from you know from a policy point of view yes yeah. we, we never we never get to do policy priorities or I mean it, it's we're always reactive and I and it would be so nice to be you know more pro proactive and what do we want to do and I mean I get more excited about that than if we always are just trying to figure out how to fix something yeah yeah so, and I'm a big advocate for going to Portsmouth New Hampshire yes I, I agree <laughs> with that I, I, yep, I think we have to do some reconnaissance. Well, you guys, we're getting our shots pretty soon in the next month or so. So guess what? <laughs> yeah, I think I got a little longer to wait. I'm, I'm not quite 75. Hmm. We're, we're going to be making it. We're going to be doing it, Trevor. But the Don't reason worry. I want, I want Portsmouth is not just to get away, is to show what can happen when you complete streets, a whole city. 
Yes. Absolutely. And what it can I, look like. Oh yeah. man, this is beautiful. That's where we have our New England leadership meetings for the um, conservation districts in well, New let's England. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Let's make what? it happen. That's a good That's thought. A trip. It sounds like a good spring trip. Yeah, it is. So my last point on this is, yes, it's my anniversary, but no, we haven't done my performance evaluation. Right. So you're going to get a memo. You're trying to avoid that, Trace. <laughs> well, so here's basically what I'm going to tell you in the memo. Here's an example evaluation form, because yeah. we should agree on what it should look like. Yeah. And my suggestion is each one of you do an evaluation with me and then we'll bring it together to a meeting because I have to have a yeah. uh, public evaluation as well. Yep. I suggest we have a roast. Yeah. <laughs> he did suggest that today. <laughs> we could do that. Okay. Yeah. All oh, right, man. I'm not laughing. Yep. So it's anyway, almost... that's it. All right. So can we do a motion to adjourn? I'm fading fast. It's on the table, you can't change it. All right. <laughs> Second. <laughs> I call the question. All right. Is there anybody that wants further discussion on this? <laughs> All those in favor. Hi, Hi. Hi Daniel. Hi, Dave Wolver. Hi, Carolyn Ness. Thank you, guys. Thank Welcome. you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, thank Mark, you. for hanging on, and, and Anna Lee. Appreciate that. Yes, thank you, Anna Lee. So. And Mark, both. Good night. Good night, Anna Lee.